I'd like to call the hearing to order this morning. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on H.R. 1900, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act. And uh, while I would normally give my opening statement uh, first, I'm going to be yielding to someone who's not here yet. So I'm going to call on the chairman of the full committee to give his opening statement at this time. Mr. Upton is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this subcommittee has held a number of hearings addressing America's growing natural gas abundance, and two clear messages have emerged. First, that plentiful and affordable domestic natural gas supplies offer many potential advantages. And second, there is bipartisan support for the development and use of domestic natural gas. Today we're going to discuss a critical step in turning these pro-natural gas words into action with H.R. 1900, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act. In a number of locations across the country, the existing natural gas pipeline infrastructure is indeed struggling to keep pace with the expanding supplies. While approvals for new pipelines often get delayed by state and federal red tape, they can last for years and years. To put it bluntly, the permitting process has not kept up with the times. This problem is especially exacerbated in areas in the Northeast and the Midwest, as we learned in our natural gas electric coordination hearings earlier in this Congress. As more and more of our energy needs become tied to the safe deliverability of natural gas, the need to build new pipeline infrastructure to connect new supplies to existing and new markets becomes more critical. This is where the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act comes in. This legislation helps to put the federal permitting process on a reasonable schedule with clear deadlines so that every federal and state agency can be held accountable and know the rules of the road. I want to thank my friend and colleague Mike Pompeo for spearheading this common sense bill. New natural gas pipeline projects are going to benefit us in many ways. First, the projects themselves would provide significant numbers of good paying jobs at a time of chronic high unemployment. And with each completed project, more natural gas can be transported to where it is needed. Countless homeowners and small business owners could benefit from lower gas and electric bills. Natural gas-dependent manufacturers could obtain sufficient supplies to sustain an American manufacturing renaissance. And a more robust pipeline infrastructure would open up promising opportunities to export natural gas supplies in our trading partners, to our trading partners around the world. The opportunities are great, but they could be stalled or even lost for good unless the pipelines start getting built. This legislation helps provide the certainty to ensure that these critical infrastructure projects get in the ground without unnecessary delay while at the same time making sure they are protective of safety and the environment. And I'll remind us all, the President signed the Pipeline Safety Bill last year, which upgraded 57 standards, new standards, for every oil and gas uh, new pipeline uh, being constructed. And I want to say that that bill passed without dissent, not only in this committee, but also on the House floor. Maybe there was one person against it, but it was overwhelming. Natural gas is going to be a big part of our energy future, but only if we cut the red tape from the past. We are a nation of builders, not a nation of bottlenecks. And I look forward to this discussion of the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act in advancing this important piece of energy and jobs legislation. And I yield the balance of my time back to the chairman. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Upton. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on H.R. 1900, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act. This subcommittee has held several hearings over the first six months of this year, many of which have focused on natural gas and our goal to achieve national energy independence through an approach that encompasses a variety of energy resources. Although there have been advantages of increasing natural gas production here in the United States, we must produce energy responsibly in a way that doesn't harm our environment or the public health. There are still reasonable concerns about methane leakage and pollution regarding natural gas production. However, I think we are taking some positive first steps. For example, the EPA's final rule to reduce harmful emissions of methane and other greenhouse gases from new natural gas wells that use hydraulic fracturing 
will help our air quality and climate in years ahead. Under the, natu under the, nat uh, the Natural Gas Act, FERC reviews applications for siting, construction, and operation of interstate natu natural gas pipelines. A company must receive a certificate of public convenience and necessity before building a pipeline. FERC also works with other agencies, such as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Fish and Wildlife Service, when, review when reviewing permit applications. According to a 2013 GAO report, the average processing time for, fi for the filing of application to certification was 225 days. H.R. 1900 modifies the Natural Gas Act to require FERC to approve or deny a certificate within 12 months of the notice of application. The bill also imposes a 90-day deadline for other agencies to decide on other permits, such as those under the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act. Lastly, the bill provides that the licenses and permits will automatically go into effect if the respective agency doesn't approve them on time. I understand that the goals of these provisions is to speed up the permitting process, but I don't believe that setting the same firm deadlines for every natural, uh, natural gas pipeline project is necessarily in the public's interest. These deadlines may be achievable for a straightforward project or for a short pipeline, but impractical for a complex pipeline that would travel hundreds of miles. I'd much rather see FERC and the experts from other agencies have the appropriate time to thoroughly review an application rather than be forced to rush and potentially make a mistake during the process. Sound science and proper environmental and technical review is essential. It isn't in anyone's interest to cut these reviews short or to reduce opportunities for public involvement. There are just a couple of issues I hope we can answer today before we start the subcommittee markup this afternoon. We should fully understand the impacts of the changes made by this legislation and make sure they are necessary. I want to thank our witnesses today, and I'm eager to hear their testimony and input to H.R. 1900. At this point, I'd like to recognize my colleague from Texas, uh, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our uh, ranking member for allowing me to take some time. Uh, first of all, coming from where I've come from, we have pipelines everywhere. I've, people have said I've never not lived on pipeline easement in the Houston area. So I'm very supportive of it. I support knowing regulatory certainty so we'll know that these things can't be drug out. But I think the bill goes so far in the deeming and approval, it may end up transferring it from a regulatory agency, FERC, who has been doing a pretty good job the last 10 years. I know it, a few years ago I had some problems at FERC. But, uh, but, you know, it may end up just transferring it to the courthouse where we can't do anything about it. Uh, but so I would hope we would look at the language of the bill uh, and particularly in Section 3 and even look at the testimony from uh, Commissioner Moeller who talks about some of the good things going on at FERC. And then typically where I come from, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. Uh, FERC was broken a few years ago, but it's been fixed. And I hate to create this uh, new legislation that will make it harder to get pipelines approved because pipelines are the safest way to move any product as we found out recently, although it was an oil train instead of anything else. But again, thank my colleague for yielding to me, and I look forward to hearing. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. At this time, I'll recognize myself for a five-minute opening uh, statement. Uh, recently, the World Economic uh, Forum was held in Davos, Switzerland, and reports coming out of that forum was that a lot of attention was focused on the tremendous fines of natural uh, resources in America and how the Eagle Ford, the Marcellus Shell, the Bakken Field and others in oil and gas gave America the opportunity to really become energy independent. And uh, people who attended that forum were struck by how the Europeans in particular were really focused on that issue. Since then we've had a lot of hearings and it's quite clear that uh, we do have a capacity uh, limit as relates to transmission of gas and pipelines. And it has become quite clear, I think, to most people that FERC lacks the ability to enforce agency decisional deadlines 
related to these natural gas pipeline applications. And with the potential growth in this market, we've had hearings also about the problems in the Northeast, the lack of a capacity to get the product there. And so I'm delighted that uh, Mr. Pompeo has introduced H.R. 1900 uh, to help us focus on this issue. It gives us the opportunity to look at his legislation and uh, see if we can come up with a way to uh, address this uh, significant issue uh, in America. So at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Kansas uh, for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield. Uh, and thanks for holding this hearing this morning on H.R. 1900. You know, we've got natural gas production, as some have said, an all-time high domestically. It's becoming an enormously important and prevalent fuel source for electricity generation, especially in the Northeast, which is a star for electrical power. Uh, because of this combination of increased production and demand for natural gas, it's absolutely vital that the law uh, for get natural gas pipelines keep up with the capacity uh, to get this stuff out of the ground. Uh, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 made a, a very early attempt at improving the gas pipeline process, uh, requiring FERC to act as the lead agency for all interstate gas, natural gas pipelines. I think that absolutely made sense at the time. And in using this authority under EPAC, FERC required that all permitting agencies complete their reviews no later than 90 days after FERC provided notice uh, that the environmental review was complete. And despite those very, very good reforms, we're seeing a growing need for natural gas pipeline infrastructure beyond that which the authors of EPAC could possibly have contemplated at the time it was, it was be put into law. Uh, there's a very recent report that found increasing delays of 90, 180 days, or even more in the construction of pipeline projects in part because we have a permitting process that still remains very uh, complex. Uh, that's the language that the GAO used, uh, called the permitting process too complex. It's why I, along with Congressman Matheson and Olson and Johnson and Gardner from this committee, introduced H.R. Uh, 1900, the Natural Gas Permitting Reform Act. Uh, we try to do two things in the law. Uh, we make common sense reforms, allowing the permitting process to go uh, create certainty for businesses. Um, we do not have to gut the whole environmental review process to do that, and this bill doesn't. Uh, the point on environmental review is very important. Nothing in this legislation takes away any authority from any permitting agency, and nothing in this legislation amends or limits any existing environmental statute. It doesn't touch NEPA, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, or any other provision related to environmental review. Look, in perfect world, I'd introduce legislation that would be a complete overhaul of this system. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is create business certainty. Uh, they can grant the permit, they can deny the permit, they can grant the permit with conditions but the agencies are forced to complete their task. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our hearing this morning and our markup uh, later uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to end by submitting letters for the record from organizations supporting H.R. 1900, including the National Association of Manufacturers, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Distribution Contractors Association, the Electric Power Supply Association, Edison Electric Institute, the American Public Power Association, and the Gas Processors Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. Well, without objection, those uh, will be entered into the record, and I yield back the balance of my time. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing focuses on Congressman Pompeo's bill, which addresses the permitting of interstate natural gas pipelines. The U.S. has more than 200,000 miles of interstate natural gas pipelines, and more new pipelines are built every year. Between 2009 and 2012, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, approved over 3,000 miles of new pipeline in 30 states. On average, it took FERC only nine and a half months to review and approve applications for pipeline projects. Earlier this year, GAO examined FERC's permitting process and found it to be predictable and consistent. This process is getting uh, pipelines permitted and built. That is what the pipeline companies told the uh, subcommittee in May when they testified that, quote, the interstate natural gas pipeline sector enjoys a favorable legal and regulatory framework for the approval of, um, of new infrastructure, end quote. They testified that pipeline development over the last decade shows that, quote, the natural gas model works, end quote. Unfortunately, the bill we are considering today proposes to change a regulatory system that is working fine. The bill would require FERC to approve or deny new pipeline certificates within 12 months. 
regardless of their potential impacts or complexity. It would require all other federal and state agencies to approve or deny required permits within 90 days after FERC completes its environmental review. According to FERC staff, some projects, due to their complexity, length, path, and the level of public concern, take longer than 12 months to review to get right. Arbitrarily limiting this type will time will deny FERC the public, uh, the opportunity, FERC and the public, the opportunity to fully consider these projects, and it will likely result in slower rather than faster permitting. If FERC is unable to properly evaluate a project within 12 months, the bill's rigid deadline could force FERC to simply deny the permit. A project that currently could be approved in 15 months after a full review might instead be denied in 12 months under this bill. The bill's limits on other agencies would create additional problems. The Environmental Protection Agency, Agency says that the bill's 90-day deadline could undermine protections under the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came to the same conclusion, stating that the bill would, quote, allow certain activities to proceed despite potential adverse and significant impacts, end quote. Other agencies and statutes will also be affected. This bill threatens the Bureau of Land Management's ability to manage rights of way across federal lands and Fish and Wildlife Service's ability to protect endangered species. If any agency does not approve or deny a permit within 90 days, the bill states that the permit automatically goes into effect. That could create new legal vulnerabilities for pipeline permits by giving a pipeline company a permit without ensuring that the environment and public health are protected. Alternatively, agencies could be forced to simply deny the permits when they are prohibited from taking the time needed for reviews required by federal law. American families expect our laws to protect health, safety, and the environment whenever pipelines are built. We, should put the, we shouldn't put those protections at risk. We should also remember that when FERC approves a pipeline, it, re, it grants the power of eminent domain, which allows a pipeline co company to take property from landowners who do not want to sell. That's not something that should happen without agencies taking the time they need for thorough analysis and thoughtful decision making. But with this bill, we get rush decisions and probably more project denials. No one benefits from that, not even the pipeline companies. Mr. Chairman, this bill has not been well thought out. It is good that we are having a hearing so that members can better understand the problems with this bill. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, that concludes the opening statements. And so uh, we have two panels of witnesses today. On the first uh, panel, there's only one witness, and that is uh, Mr. Philip Moeller, who is our uh, commissioner over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and accompanying him uh, is Mr. Jeff Wright, who is the FERC Director of the Office of Energy Projects. And I'm sure that, uh, I, know, I know sometimes in Congress, members need to confer with their staff. I'm sure that's not the case in your situation, Mr. Moeller, but if you do, I understand Mr. Wright's quite an expert, so we're delighted that he's here as well. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moeller, thanks very much for being with us today. Uh, we do appreciate your views uh, on this important issue. And uh, at this time, I'd recognize myself for uh, five minutes of questions. Uh, and I guess before I ask you questions, I should give you an opportunity to make an opening statement as well. So I'll recognize you for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Phil Moeller. I'm a sitting commissioner at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's an honor to ba be back before you again today. And the testimony today related to H.R. 1900, the Natural Gas Pipeline P Permitting Reform Act, uh, my testimony reflects only my views, but I can elaborate on some of my colleagues' views as well, if you'd like. From the onset, I want to thank you for shining the light, highlighting the issue of the need for additional energy infrastructure in this country. Consumers 
generally speaking, uh, enjoy abundant, reliable, and safe energy of many different forms, but they generally don't like to look at the pipes and wires that delivers it to them. And getting infrastructure built is, frankly, getting more difficult in the country, so the fact that you're focusing on this is a relevant topic. Similarly, uh, focusing on governmental agency action in a timely manner is relevant as well and certainly uh, specific to this and, and the uh, natural gas industry is relevant and timely. I think that FERC performs generally very well when it comes to energy projects including natural gas pipelines and I think that observation was largely supported by the report that's been referenced a few times already, the 2013 GAO report on pipeline permitting. Our jurisdiction under Section 7 of the Natural Gas Act relates to interstate pipelines those that are proposed within a state, intrastate pipelines, uh, that jurisdiction rests solely with the states. Now, specific to natural gas pipeline certificates, project applications that we see at FERC uh, have a wide range. They can be relatively small, uncontested upgrades to existing facilities, or they can range to a, a new pipeline that, that covers hundreds of miles. And so naturally, the smaller and less contested projects can review, be reviewed by us in a shorter amount of time. The complex applications take longer. We uh, did an internal review over the last few years since federal fiscal year 2009, and in that time we had a total of 548 applications submitted to the Commission. Projects in what we called the prior notice no, pro no protests category averaged 75 days for a Commission decision. Those projects in the protests policy issues or major construction category average 375 days for a Commission decision. We stress to project developers the importance of public involvement when considering their projects, although some developers are better at outreach than others. G generally, those that employ aggressive public outreach tend to be rewarded with less contentiousness and faster Commission decisions. In my time at the Commission, I believe every new major pipeline project has had some kind of a route change based on public involvement. So hopefully we're seen as responsive to the public that's concerned about these projects. However, we're often dependent on other federal agencies, a long list of them is in my testimony, to review aspects of the proposed projects. And sometimes, of course, state and local governments are involved as well. A specific to H.R. 1900, I've been informed by our Commission staff that the 12-month timeline for action is achievable once the Commission determines that an application is complete. That's a key point. And I would respectfully suggest that clarifying that aspect might help the bill's effectiveness uh, when it would have become law. Uh, the timeline for resource agencies adds an admirable level of accountability for these resource agencies involved. My only caution is that without high-level agency oversight, directing the agencies to prioritize these permits, a timeline could result in agencies either denying certain permits or adding burdensome conditions as a way to protect themselves from accusations of insufficient review. Vigilant oversight of resource agency actions will be necessary if these requirements become law. Apart from the bill itself, uh, other actions would assist a more timely consideration of proposed timelines three areas. The first is the one I just reiterated. The management of federal resource agencies have to be following these projects and these reviews to make sure that they are priorities to be reviewed in a timely manner. And we've seen a wide range. When agencies make this a priority, we get timely decisions. If they don't, things can, they can drag on and usually consumers are the ones uh, who pay the price. Second area is that we suggest that all natural gas gas pipeline developers should take advantage of the Commission's pre-filing process, but not all do so. This process allows a lot of the issues to be resolved with the Commission staff and various stakeholders before a formal application. Once the formal application is in, the ex parte rules apply and all the communication needs to be in writing. A third area, as noted in the GAO report, is that some states have designated a one-stop resource agency to coordinate state decisions on proposed pipelines. And for those states that have done it, it's generally added to regulatory certainty. 
For those states that haven't, it's typically a lot more difficult to get the pipeline uh, actually constructed or, or at least considered. So I would respectfully suggest that those states that don't have such a one-stop permitting resource agency con consider doing so. Um, again, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate the chance to talk about infrastructure, and I look forward to any questions. Well, Mr. Moeller, thanks so much, and we appreciate your opening statement. And now I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, first of all, in the opening statements up here, uh, I think you could de detect that on one side of the aisle there was the impression that there really was not that much of a problem out there, and on the other side of the aisle there was uh, some reference that there is a problem out there relating to the approval of natural gas pipelines. Since you're a commissioner there at FERC and you deal with this on a regular basis, what is your opinion? Is there a need for assistance in speeding up these applications or, or not? Well, I think the trend is such that because of the domestic abund uh, the abundant domestic resource that, that uh, several of the members referenced earlier, we're probably going to see an increase in pipelines. And I think the numbers show that we're getting an increase in the number of applications. Um, it's probably project by project as to whether there's a problem. Uh, resource agencies n need to have, I think, the accountability aspect of it is good. So uh, w there's a growing, we're certainly trending in a way where we're going to be a lot busier at FERC, and to the extent that federal agencies can stick to timelines, I think the process would, would benefit. And uh, how many people are really involved in the application process for a pipeline at FERC? Well, I... It, again, it depends on the project, but we have internal uh, engineers, uh, particularly analysts. Mr. Wright can probably elaborate more. We also have contractors that can perform environmental reviews, uh, but it depends on the extent of the project. But right. uh, from just a few to, to many, especially if it's involving new pipe. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> Typically, what takes the most time, I'm assuming, is the environmental impact uh, study. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, arguably, maybe the pre-filing process, depending on the extent of the project. But once the application is filed, yes, the, the environmental review, whether it's an e, uh, environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment, uh, would be, would take the most amount of time in terms of the and, process. and under the Energy Power Act of 2.5, you all have the authority to conduct the environmental impact study, correct? Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned the pre-filing, of course, in your opening statement as well. Would you elaborate a little bit on what is included in this pre-filing process? Well, the, typically the developers will come to the commission with an idea of what they're proposing. Sometimes there's an economic element of it as well in terms of who's going to bear the burden of, um, of financing it. And, but, but mostly it's going to be a focus on environmental aspects of the project. And the feeling is that if, if the developer can work with the commission staff and the stakeholders, a wide range of stakeholders, they can eliminate a lot of misunderstandings that could occur in terms of routing, mitigation, and uh, those are just much easier to work out before the formal ex parte rules mm -hmm. uh, apply. You know, I've heard uh, some people refer to it as sort of a Byzantine system, which uh, it, would that be a fair characterization or is that being a little bit, uh, it's not, maybe it's not that difficult, but you are dealing with uh, state issues, you're dealing with local issues, you're dealing with a lot of other government agencies as well. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, it, it becomes more Byzantine the more agencies that are, in, that are involved. If it's relatively focused where maybe only one or two federal agencies are in the loop, uh, that's better. You start adding on to that, uh, it, there's just that many more decision points. Right. And have you had the opportunity to review H.R. 1900? I have. Yes. And your personal view, do you think this is a good piece of legislation? Do you support this? or? As I noted in the testimony, I think the key in terms of the 12-month timeline 
is having an ability for the Commission, perhaps through Mr. Wright, to, to designate once an application is complete that the timeline kicks in then. Uh, a lot of the problems we've had with developers are you know, they're, they're missing something and, uh, it, and, and that delays the process. If once it's deemed complete, uh, we feel that the 12-month timeline is uh, we can, we okay. can accomplish that. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McNerney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, my, my good here. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, for your thoughtful testimony. I think it was very informative. Um, it seemed to me that you were saying that uh, if, you, if companies participated in the pre-filing process and did sufficient outreach that their problems were, were likely to be less difficult and they might meet uh, faster timelines. Is that right? Correct. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner Muller, the, F, the FERC data shows that from 2009 to 2012, the Commission approved 69 major natural gas pipeline projects spanning 30, uh, 3,000 miles in 30 states. Does that sound about right? Sounds about right. Uh, well, when the CEO of Dominion Energy testified on behalf of the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America in May, he told this subcommittee that the industry can add new pipeline capacity in a timely, market-responsive manner and that the interstate natural gas pipeline sector enjoys a favorable legal and regulatory framework for the approval of new infrastructure. His conclusion was that the natural gas model works. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you thought that that situ situation had changed since May. The only thing I would add is that we, we really lack sufficient capacity in the Northeast, and the typical financing model was long-term contracts for local gas companies. And the new demand is electric generation that's driving a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and that financing model doesn't work in the Northeast, and we need more pipe in the Northeast. So that's something we're struggling with. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you? I yes. don't believe that, you are, that this bill addresses that problem, does it? Uh, oh, Congressman, no, th uh, this is not specific to that, correct. It does, it does not address that problem. All right, thank you. I didn't mean to imply that it did. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. Um, well, the pipeline industry told us that the permitting process works. They reiterated today that the process is generally very good. Um, the, GEO, the GAO recently examined the issue as well. Uh, and the GE, GAO found that the permitting process for interstate natural gas pipeline is consistent. Do you agree with the GAO that FERC's permitting process is consistent for pipelines? Yes. Well, it's, uh, it takes FERC an average of nine and a half months to decide on an application for a pipeline certification, uh, but not all projects are clearly the same. Permitting process application uh, applies to applications for a single compressor station uh, and to a short extension of existing pipeline. It also applies to, say, a 500-mile pipeline with multiple compressors that goes across many rivers. Um, as you point out in your testimony, the more complex projects take longer to permit than the smaller projects. Is it realistic to think that the, that the permitting, permitting process for every project, no matter how complex, can be completed within 12 months? Uh, well, I... My impression is that we can do that if the bill becomes law. <laughs> uh, well, the bill doesn't start the clock until the application uh, is complete. It starts the clock when FERC issues a notice of that an application has been filed, even if it isn't complete. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I, referencing my earlier point, Clarifying that we get a, we can deem an application complete uh, would be very helpful. Do you think there's a risk that uh, applications will be denied for insufficient time? Something we have to be vigilant about. Um, and do you think it's realistic to expect other agencies to issue permits within 90 days or even 120 days if the application filed with them are not complete? If it's not complete, no. If it's complete, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. 
This time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Barton, five minutes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good when honesty breaks out here at the subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate the commissioner's admittance that if we pass the law, he would enforce it. That's a, a noble thing in the Obama administration, so we, uh, we're glad to know that. You know, back in 2005, Mr. Dingle and Mr. Green, I think Mr. Barrow maybe was on the committee, Mr. Whitfield, myself, Mr. Pitts, Mr. Terry, we all passed this Energy Policy Act in 2005, and we gave the FERC additional authority, let the FERC kind of coordinate and serve as a quarterback, but we didn't give enforcement. We didn't put in penalties for noncompliance because the assumption was if, if we required this coordination that, that all the various agencies that had to uh, coordinate and cooperate in what's considered to be a complex and complicated uh, permitting process would, would comply. Well, that's apparently turned out not to be. Do you agree that... Uh, that the current law as written does not give the FERC uh, any, any uh, meaningful enforcement authority when other agencies fail to comply with the various uh, deadlines and uh, uh, requirements under the current law? I would concur. Okay. Now, the, the solution that Mr. Pompeo has come up with is to give a certain amount of time, and if they don't comply, then just it's 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 deemed or 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 decided that 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 uh, their their failure to act means they approve it. Um, would would the FERC have a different enforcement mechanism than that? Is there something that's not in the bill that instead of saying we'll give you so much time with the possible extension, but after that period of time, we're going to assume that those agencies don't have a problem and move forward? Would, would you prefer some different mechanism or that would FERC prefer some different mechanism? We haven't discussed any alternative. Okay. Do you, you, do you, then are you satisfied that the bill as written uh, is acceptable? I believe that uh, if it became law, it would add an, a level of accountability to the resource agencies, but we would all have to be vigilant to make sure that they didn't have the incentive to just deny permits or add burdensome conditions as a way of uh, essentially covering themselves. Well, we have a, um, a good problem in that the United States is blessed with abundant supplies of natural gas and they're geographically well situated, uh, close to uh, potential markets. Uh, it's a clean burning fuel. It's an environmentally benign fuel. Um, so if we can come, come to some understandings what, what an acceptable permitting process is, give everybody that is a stakeholder an opportunity to participate in the process, but if, if, if projects appear to be uh, uh, mutually beneficial to both the, the supplier and the um, consumer that they should go forward, um, we're going to have a great outcome for this country. Um, and this bill attempts to, to I think, s create a balance between the, all the various competing interests, interests so that the, these projects can move forward unless there's really a problem. And um, some on the, on the um, more uh, liberal side of the agenda just don't want these projects to go forward under any circumstances. Now, it's not a gas pipeline, but you see that in the Keystone Pipeline. So I think the Pompeo bill is, is a good step forward, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we mark it up expeditiously at subcommittee, full committee on the floor, and send it to the other body. This would, this would serve as a, um, a good example to the American people that the Congress can solve problems and do things that are mutually beneficial for the entire country. And with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clarify for the record 
Uh, people aren't against pipelines per se, and my opposition to the XL pipeline is not because it's a pipeline, but because of the addition to the uh, greenhouse gases that would be expended just to get that dirty tar sands oil ready to be put into a pipeline. But that does raise the question of a legislation that was adopted by the Congress, where there was an absolute deadline for the President to approve it. And he said he couldn't do the analysis in time, so he disapproved it. And I think that's the point that uh, Mr. Mueller was just making and others, that y you may get the opposite of what you hope for. Before an interstate natural pa gas pipeline can be built and operated, it has to get a permit from FERC. And the Pompeo bill amends the Natural Gas Act to establish a 12-month deadline for FERC to act one way or the other. Uh, under these uh, same rigid deadlines, we would have the same situation apply to every project, whether it's a straightforward 30-mile mi pipeline in the middle of nowhere that crosses no rivers, or a complex 500-miles uh, pipeline that goes through a major population center and crosses a dozen rivers. Uh, Commissioner Muller, I appreciate your testimony, but I want to ask a question for Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, you're a senior member of FERC's nonpartisan career staff, aren't you? Yes. Uh, uh, the FERC staff works on pipeline applications every day. You work on the easy ones and the more difficult ones. Do you believe that it's feasible for FERC to make a decision within one year of the notice of application for every complex pipeline project? I believe 12 months is adequate when FERC determines that it has a complete application before it. So sometimes FERC takes longer because they, you don't have a complete application? Correct. Which means the company didn't give you all the information you need. Is that right? Yes. Well, maybe they would just soon run out the clock and get a automatic approval. The bill doesn't start the clock when the application is complete. It starts the clock when FERC issues a notice that an application has been filed even if it isn't complete. Isn't that right? That is correct, sir. Before FERC can make a final decision on an application, you not only have to do an environmental analysis, but engineering and rate reviews. Isn't that right? That is correct. These are important reviews to ensure that the environment, public health, and safety are protected. They're also necessary to make sure that rates are fair and reasonable. Uh, Mr. Wright, if FERC could not complete the required analysis and certificate work for a project within the 12-month deadline established by this bill, what would happen? Would FERC have to dismiss the application? That would be a likely outcome if we were not satisfied with the environmental review that we've come to at that point in time and the review of the other matters that are, would be before us. So this bill aimed at speeding up FERC permitting could actually end up having the opposite effect. A project that could have been approved in 15 months, let's say, may just get denied if FERC is required to make a final decision in 12 months before it's ready to issue a certificate. Mr. Wright, the bill also establishes a 90-day deadline for all other agencies to approve or deny their permits once the environmental review is complete. If they fail to do so, uh, the permits are automatically granted. Do you think other agencies may end up denying permits that would otherwise have been approved because of this deadline and automatic uh, issuance provision? That is a possible outcome. If this bill became law, do you think it would actually result in interstate natural gas pipelines being permitted faster than they are today, or could it backfire and create problems and permitting de delays? I don't believe it would effectively cause pipelines to be permitted faster than they are now, and, and quite possibly if we would have to deny a application, it could take longer for certain projects. Well, I thank you for your answers to these questions. The current system is getting pipelines permitted. That's what we want. This bill could result in slower permitting while also threatening safety, health, and environmental protections. That shouldn't be what we want. This bill has not been thought through. It certainly is not ready to go to the floor this month. The committee should take the time to really understand the current permitting process before making changes that will have uh, serious consequences. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I yield back my time. I, I would like to remind the members that Mr. Wright is not here as a witness today. He's here to lend technical support to Commissioner Moeller. 
And since Mr. Waxman addressed all of his questions to Mr. Wright, Mr. Mueller, do you have any comment to any of his questions that you would like to? Mr. Hear? Chairman, I, I'd like to hear what Mr. Bull has to say, but Mr. Wright is there with the nitty gritty. Mr. Wright is not here. He is not here as a witness. He's here to lend technical support. Now, he was here at our request. Well, look, you heard him, and now I'm going to give Mr. Mueller an opportunity to respond uh, well, let's since hear, he's the witness. That, that's fine. Let's hear from Mr. Mueller. Um, let's see. The the twelve month deadline. We think, as we as I said earlier, as as long as we feel that a application is deemed complete, it's a, it's a deadline that we've been assured we can work around. And uh, to the extent that that adds certainty, that's a good thing. Uh, the agencies. It seems to me that more accountability toward them is a good thing. Um, we are trending toward needing more pipelines based on domestic supply and the, frankly we're burning a lot more gas to make electricity. So as trend lines go, uh, I appreciate the committee's focus on this. Do you think we should start the 12 months after the application is complete? Yes. Thank you. At this time I would like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lida, for five minutes. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks very much for our witness for being here and the technical witness. You know, it's been uh, very, the questioning has been very interesting this morning. Also, it's also kind of interesting this morning. There was an article in the uh, Akron Beacon Journal, which is on the other side of the state from me. Uh, I, I'm from Northwest Ohio, and uh, the article is kind of interesting. It says it's the headline is "Shale Boom Creating Shortage of Affordable Housing in Eastern Ohio." And reading through the story, it's talking about uh, the reason for that is, is because of all of the uh, drilling company workers that are coming in. And a lot of places uh, around the state of Ohio would uh, very much like to be in a situation sh say that uh, they've got a problem out there because there's just not enough uh, housing. And so, uh, you know, as we look at what's happening in Ohio and especially with uh, our Utica Shale and what's happening across our state, I think one of the questions that the uh, the chairman had started off with a little bit earlier was a question he had mentioned and asked, uh, you know, is there a need to speed up the process? And I, I believe that if I understood it right, you said uh, you're, you're probably looking at there going to be a need for more pipelines across the country. And have you done any kind of analysis of how much, you know, let's just say looking down the road in that crystal ball of five years or ten years of what we're looking at and what we're going to need and, and more pipeline across the country? I don't think FERC has done that specifically, but I know you'll be hearing from some industry witnesses later, and I know there are a number of studies that particularly the, the Pipeline Association has undertaken looking at those projected numbers. But is any, any kind of an idea off the top of your head what those numbers might be? Uh, I've seen their numbers, but I wouldn't want to misquote them. But as you noted, with this supply coming in places that we didn't expect even a few years ago, uh, there's there'll be a, a great opportunity to expand pipelines for okay. consumers' benefits. Well, and, and just uh, also uh, something that the chairman had also asked about uh, on the pre-filing process of, uh, on the projects. I'm just kind of curious um, on that uh, in, your, in your testimony. You said that uh, all natural gas pipeline developers should take advantage of the commission's pre-filing process, but not all do so. Any idea how many are, you know, percentage-wise take advantage of the pre-filing? Mr. Wright tells me 70 percent in the last year. 70 percent. And uh, could I ask, uh, just following up on that, uh, how long, how much more time does that add to the overall process? Is it, does it lengthen it? Does it help shorten? Or what, what are we looking at? Oh, it helps shorten that? the process because, again, a lot of the issues and perhaps some misunderstandings between the developer, the commission staff, and the stakeholders. Uh, have an opportunity to be resolved before the formal written only communication requirements kick in. Okay. And uh, w just uh, also kind of curiosity, um, are these large pipelines or, or developers, are they small or what kind of, are, or is it kind of a mix of everybody that uh, might be in the Related pre-filing? Right. Well, I, I think every, every project developer should take advantage of it and uh, the larger ones especially. But um, I think most of the larger ones do. It's, I think, 
to their detriment if they don't. When you're talking about to their detriment, it's not to, to dwell on one area, but I'm just kind of curious, uh, does it reduce the cost quite a bit or what happens in that pre-filing? When you look at, you know, trying to get the time the timeline down and make sure the, the paperwork's involved, that it would be involved is there. But uh, is, there, is there a cost reduction to the developer in the end or what, what, what would you say on that? I think almost universally because, again, uh, if you have a misunderstanding that has to be resolved in writing, it's so much less efficient than doing it in, in another manner ahead of the formal application filing. So uh, I think it saves, uh, and, and I think the industry would would testify to the fact that it's it saves a lot of money and time if they take advantage of it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. This time, recognize the gentleman from um, uh, Michigan, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Uh, these questions to Mr. Moeller. Uh, the new subsection 1 created by this bill would require that FERC approve or deny certificates of public convenience and necessity within 12 months. Can you tell me approximately what percentages of these certificate requests currently take longer than 12 months? Approximately 10 percent. Okay. Why? Their complexity, usually. Sometimes... What, is uh, this, what does this do about those complex uh, questions? Does it, does it give the authority, does it give the commission more authority, more money, or anything to help them achieve a quicker solution to those difficult, complex requests? The answer is no, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think with, with the addition of, a, of the certainty of an application being deemed complete, that 12-month Deadline would but if, if it's provide not certain. if it's not that's going to cause considerable delay is it not? We think that would improve the bill would improve the bill. Thank you now uh, Commissioner the new subsection j2 allows agencies to request that FERC grant a 30-day extension if the agency needs more than 90 days to approve permits required by such laws as the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act do you believe that FERC has the technical expertise and understanding to determine if a federal or state agency issuing permits required by these and other acts do or don't need additional time? Yes or no? Yes. Now, uh, you do have a problem here, however, with the fact that a lot of authorities are delegated by the federal government to the, to the states, such as clean air, clean water, and others where the states are permitted to take action under a coordinated plan program of federal state cooperation, isn't that right? Yes. What is that going? What is this bill going to do to those matters? Well, it would would apply the deadlines to those agencies as well. Uh, even if the state deadline might be different, and even if the problem in the, that the state confronts is more is more difficult and complex. That's how I read the bill. Now. As you know, more utilities are planning on building new natural gas-fired plants. In order to do so, they will need more pipeline infrastructure to support these plants. Do you believe that the FERC has funding, staff, and expertise to consider future applications in a timely manner? Yes or no? For now, yes. But in the future, probably not, right? I think the way things are trending, uh, and Mr. Wright could elaborate more, uh, I'd be happy to have the problem of more application okay. and the need for more. So, so in the future, you're looking at a problem. Thank you. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the chair has, has said that I can't ask questions of Mr. Wright, so I'm going to ask these questions of you. Are all applications submitted to FERC for pipeline projects the same? No. Yes or no? That is, they're, they're not then all the same length. They deal with different links of the pipeline different kinds of terrain, different uh, problems such as being under the ocean or uh, under bodies of water and so forth. And uh, th th that's correct, is it not? Yes, correct. Does FERC receive incomplete applications requiring additional information from the applicant, yes or no? Yes. Is there a deadline for which applicants need to submit complete application information? Uh, yes, in the data requests. 
uh, is that an absolute uh, complete submission that you can require, or, or does that still leave you holes in the information that you need? Well, if there are holes, we won't grant the we won't dis we won't make. So that means that means delay. It means you will reject the application because you have no choice under the legislation. Is there a, a now, if FERC were not able to complete its due diligence review within 12 months as required under the proposed legislation, uh, do you believe that more applications would be denied? No. But there would be denials because of this, would there not? You've already indicated that. I think it would depend on each application. Now, uh, we have some other problems. I'm about running out of time here. Um, but I thank you for your assistance to the committee, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dingle. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moeller, uh, for your testimony today. I take to heart your concern about uh, the application being completed, deemed full and complete. I just want to make sure that, that I understand the pre-filing process. This is an extensive process when it's used. It, Lots of back and forth, including environmental concerns. Lots of issues are resolved in that pre-filing time period in a Correct. way that, and stakeholders are also notified during the pre-filing process. So um, we bring all the relevant folks that are concerned about a particular pipeline, have an interest in that pipeline, have a chance to engage during that pre-filing process when a company chooses to engage in the in the pre-filing. Yes. Uh, how long does that take typically? Well, it's it varies widely depending on the complexity of the project. I would imagine it's ranged from maybe six to 12 months generally. So this is not a shotgun deal. This is a long, thoughtful, lots of engagement process. When done properly, Correct. where all stakeholders get an opportunity right. to, to state their case and, and, and make their arguments and improve the process and improve the pipeline pathway and make sure we're doing all the things, including protect the environment, complying with all the relevant statutes. Precisely. Uh, why do you think some companies choose not to do that? They may not be aware of it. Uh, so these are typically smaller. The folks who choose not to do that, is it fair to say they're typically smaller pipelines, less sophisticated businesses perhaps? I mean, to not be aware of a pre-filing opportunity. Yeah. I, I think typically that's right. Some, some have chosen not to, but I think they've missed an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, those that, have, that are, that are met perhaps newer to the development. Sure. Yeah, don't realize make, the advantages of it. Make this, I, I mention all this because I think it's important in the context of these deadlines, which to someone who didn't, was unaware of this, this extended process might think 90 days or 12 months was too short a time period. It's been um, fascinating to listen to some folks here today who, who normally object to things, be concerned about denial of permits <laughs> and think this piece of legislation is a bad piece of legislation because it might delay a permit. I'm I'm thrilled to hear now that some folks uh, on the other side are, are concerned about uh, delaying of the permitting process. It's uh, maybe the first time in my 30 months in Congress that I've, if I've heard that. Um, I, I wrote this in a way that I thought would be bipartisan. All, all, I'm, all I was trying to do was get deadlines established, and as you talked about accountability inside the other agencies, really not as much about FERC, uh, but about the other agencies that require permits. Uh, I want to come back to something Mr. Barton asked. So in the alternative of setting a deadline, in 90 days, I'll concede we could make it 91 or 89. I'll concede that 90 is, is uh, in some sense, arbitrary. But I think it's important to have that deadline. In the alternative, what, what are the other mechanisms to tell these agencies to just do their job? Essentially, people could uh, bring an action against them in some some. So we can go to litigation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this, is, this is why I think this is absolutely important. Um, and to your point, I think... Uh, directing these agencies to be accountable and prioritize this permitting process um, uh, needs to be done and needs to set these deadlines in a way that uh, is meaningful. And I'm, I'm happy if we need to talk about the trigger, the start point, uh, I'm, I'm happy to consider that. Uh, last thing, and, and this is a bit of a tangent, I just want to talk about reporting and data. Uh, in, in 2013, uh, GEO stated that it had to use public records to get at the actual length of the time. Uh, that permitting process took for projects and to be approved by FERC. Uh, do you think uh, that in order to provide a better understanding of the time it takes to get the real good data, uh, that it would be appropriate to begin actual tracking inside of FERC of how long these processes take and maybe inside of each of the agencies as well? We've, uh, I think we've, we've 
hopefully done a good job of adding some transparency by by uh, tracking information on our website. Great. But Perfect. generally, yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. This time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from um, Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, I know my earlier statement, I appreciate uh, being able to have part of the opening statement. But Mr. Mueller, uh, in question from our uh, from Chairman Dingell, um, you have a 90 percent approval rate of applications once they've deemed uh, within the year already? A decision of a 90 percent within 12 months. Within 12 months. Uh, I wish we had other federal agencies that had that kind of record. Um, and I know FERC's problems, and like I said earlier, you heard I had problems with FERC many years ago, and but the, the problems I had were fixed. I mean, early part of 2001, 2002, of course, in Texas, we had to live with Enron and part of the problems that uh, uh, to deal with that. But um, I, I knew you were doing a good job because I, get, I wasn't getting complaints from any of my companies. So, uh, but 90% approval rate is amazing. Uh, one of the concerns I have, and I know the Corps of Engineers and EPA has provided techno comics on the bill, they raise concerns that automatic permitting would lead permits that are inconsistent with the requirements of the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. Um, this committee doesn't control resources, the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA. Our appropriations process does that. And if either FERC doesn't have the appropriations or those agencies don't have it, um, you know, by setting arbitrary time limits means that it could possibly just be denied. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's a potential. Yeah. So that's an option. Um, if you don't make the year, uh, then and if the information is not available, you end up denying it because some agency, and that's not just federal agencies. For example, I know one of my questions I, I want to get to is that um, some states have one-stop agency designations. And I assume those are much quicker in responding. Um, but what if a state doesn't respond? And, uh, and of course, Congress doesn't control those states, and we don't want to. So we're, there's a lot of moving uh, targets in this, in this issue. But, uh, but let me ask some particular questions. Uh, you and your staff interact every, with their other agency and state permitting every day. And let's say that the agency couldn't prepare, finish preparing a permit before the 90-day deadline. Um, and that would mean the unwritten permit would automatically take effect, or would it be denied? I believe the bill has another 30-day potential extension. Okay. Um, and, and then under the bill, as I read it, it would be deemed approved. Even if there was no control by FERC or on a state agency not responding or another federal agency? That's how I read the legislation. Um, my other concern, I said it earlier, in increased litigation, if something's approved and there's something left out it's deemed approved uh, you know we just move it from an agency that's a regulatory agency to a courtroom and if you think you have regulatory delay go to the uh, uh, either even a state court system but a federal court system it will it will be delayed even more um, one part of the bill that i don't have a huge interest uh, or issue with is that they codify the 90-day deadline and that said there's some of the concern. Uh, I would hope that before this bill gets out and we're going to have a markup this afternoon, we would at least make sure that that application is de de deemed complete before the time frames run. And uh, simply because, again, I look at this as a, as a solution in search of a problem if you have a 90 percent <laughs> approval rating. But, uh, <laughs> but, if, but if we're going to do something, let's don't mess up a system that's working 90 percent of the time. And, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. This time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So here's the question I would have. If we're, if we're going to define uh, and if we decided we wanted to, to change that the time starts when the application is complete, when is the application complete? And let me preface that by saying that I've had some experience with uh, a different agency or different agencies where my constituents think they've got everything complete and then a new request comes in from the agency and then we get that complete and then another request comes in from the agency. So I just want to make sure that if we go down that path, we're not, we're not setting ourselves up for failure. 
So when would the application be complete under your per projections or thoughts? Well, I think Mr. Wright could probably come up with some very specific examples, but uh, I know that we've had applications come in and, and perhaps part of the environmental review is somewhat deficient and uh, in that sense, if if we enter the pre if we enter the, the application period as I referenced earlier, it's just a lot a lot more inefficient to get that resolved in writing. So uh, it'll depend on each different project, uh, but it's going to be I think largely environmental related uh, studies or uh, yeah, there are potential rate making issues that, that could be hanging out there. Uh, most of those get resolved. The, at least discussed ahead of time in terms of making sure there isn't subsidization of an expansion by existing customers. Those are relatively detailed but important matters. Yeah. And I guess my, my one concern with deviating from the bill as it's currently written is that I wouldn't want to get into a situation where there were just a series of new requests and uh, would maybe want to see some limitation uh, placed on that. That being said, I do appreciate that, you know, folks can talk these things out before the official process starts. That always is very helpful. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Muller, in your testimony, you indicate there were some 548 applications submitted since 2009. How many fell into the prior notice no protest category? Total of 75 over those years. Okay, thank you. And would the replacement of an existing pipeline go through the same project approval as a new pipeline? Yes. What proportion of applications is for the replacement of existing pipelines versus entirely new lines, would you suggest? We, we can get you those numbers. In terms of an actual replacement, mm -hmm. a relatively few. In terms of additions to existing pipes, such as updated compressors, or uh, there, there are many more of those. Do replacement pipeline projects in general take the same amount of time to approve as new pipelines? I think it depends on their environmental impacts in terms of where they're going and how much land they disturb. Mm -hmm. And in your experience, would you say that pipeline projects in areas of higher population density are more likely to fall into your second category, that oh, yes. protests and policy issues and, and major construction? Yes, absolutely. Okay, it appears the areas that are deficient in pipeline infrastructure currently are areas with higher density. Uh, for example, areas like the Northeast because of the increased gas development in the Marcellus Shale and the strong demand for gas in that region. Is that the case? Well, that's, that's part of it, but as I referenced earlier, uh, part of the challenge in the Northeast is that the new growing use of electricity there is, uh, or of natural gas is to make electricity, uh, and the, the financing model uh, traditionally for pipelines has been that the local distribution company enters into long-term contracts to get the pipe built. The new demand in New England is generators who may or may not be called on a daily basis, so they, they can't be expected to go into long-term contracts. So we have that kind of conundrum of needing more pipe in the Northeast, but uh, the traditional financing model really doesn't apply to the new demand. Okay. Well, if we have, a, have different categories of pipeline projects with differing circumstances, it seems to me that this um, one size it's all policy for project consideration is likely to shortchange those projects that are the most complex through the highest density areas or are perhaps controversial. Um, I'm very concerned about pipeline safety. Uh, I had represented when I was in the state legislature in New York um, areas that were impacted by serious pipeline failures uh, that cost people their lives. Uh, it seems to me that an average approval time of a little over a year for a pipeline that will operate for some, what, four to five decades, perhaps, is simply not unreasonable. Um, your comments to that statement? I think it will highlight the need for the pre-filing process and that to be thorough 
extensive and uh, aggressive public outreach for any such projects. Those, those issues will be highlighted uh, under a 12-month timeline. Mm -hmm. But even in light of, as was earlier discussed, some of the track record, the track record at the uh, agency, uh, are we sacrificing um, at the expense of uh, pipeline failure? Well, I don't think so. I think we've had a pretty good record uh, in terms of how we deal with applications. As I noted, the 90 percent. Uh, the trend is that we're getting more of them, though. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Jim and yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Thank you for being here. I'll always appreciate uh, your efforts to keep us updated. Uh, I'm just uh, curious when we talk about the uh, protest and no protest. Um, out of a, in, in an, let's say a year's time, how many of the projects will be protested? Well, I have a total here of, uh, in fiscal year, well, for the last five years, basically the ones that haven't been protested average right about 75. Yeah, no, those are the number of days. I'm asking for the number of total. Uh, you take the total number of applications, how many of the applications are actually protested? Uh, we'll get you that, that number, but I, I think it's uh, more and more generally. Yeah. Yeah, it, I would not be surprised that it's more and more, and then that uh, begs the question of who is filing uh, these complaints or protests. Well, on major projects, there are going to be economic and uh, you know, market issues that are that are worthy of shippers and perhaps other entities being involved. Um, in terms of smaller projects, we've seen more sophisticated public outreach in terms of social media uh, being concerned about, say, a compressor station. So uh, it can range from major corporations to individuals. So uh, is there an effort, do you see, by Sierra Club or the NRDC to file protests on each one of these projects? You know, we can get you that. I, I think, generally speaking, everybody's more interested in infrastructure perhaps than they used to be. <laughs> That's kind. <laughs> Genteel. Uh, then another area, now for something completely different uh, than who's protesting and why. Uh, but I just uh, received an email as we, I've been sitting here from Sap Brothers, which is a small chain of truck stops along Interstate 80 in the Midwest, headquartered in my district, uh, inviting me to uh, one of their high volume uh, CNG pumps that they're putting in at their stations. Uh, you've mentioned the additional need for natural gas pipelines to electric generators and with the new rules and regulations coming down uh, from the EPA from the White House, there'll be even more pressure on natural gas. So my question is, has FERC started looking ahead at way uh, towards uh, ahead to the future pipeline, gas pipeline needs in this country as natural gas will be used more for transportation and electrical generation? Well, specifically, we haven't done any projections, but industry entities have, as I think you know, one of my major concerns has been the fact that we're transitioning so quickly to using more natural gas, and there are, there are reliability issues there. They're not insurmountable, but it's a, it's a very different paradigm going from, frankly, a pile of coal to a just-in-time fuel delivery on a pipeline. Well, and that's, that's part of my concern is, is the economy starts naturally moving to natural gas and transportation and then artificially from rules and regulations. Uh, the demand will be there and the infrastructure will be needed. So how do we, how do we get your, your agency to look forward? Is that something that uh, we need to do legislatively in addition to 
the Pompeo bill? I think that we can look to the industry projections for, for pipeline capacity. Uh, your continued oversight of how we do our job is, is, is uh, appropriate. Um, I think we have done a good job, but as I referenced earlier, the trend is that we are getting more of these, and uh, we need to stay on top of that. And, and um, so I welcome your oversight. All right. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. This time, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much for being here. I want to focus on the part of the bill that permit uh, that says that permits automatically go into effect if agencies do not approve or deny the permits within 90 days. Because this kind of um, stuck out for me, especially when you consider the complex projects. This provision appears to be very problematic because I understand these permits are not simply yes or no, green light or red light. Uh, for example, a water discharge permit typically involves uh, some limits. A clean air permit includes specific requirements such as emission limitations based on control technology or methods of operation. Uh, these permits can be very detailed documents especially with the complex projects that need to be written uh, by the agencies. And uh, let's say we go to that scenario, a complex project, uh, the agencies could not complete their, uh, their review and conditions within the 90-day deadline. Would that mean under this bill for an unwritten, an unwritten permit would automatically go into effect? I believe as the legislation is drafted, there is another 30-day option. And then, yes, the, as I read the bill, uh, the permits would go into effect. Well, I think that is a major deficiency in the bill. I, I understand the need uh, to, to boost efficient agency review and the drafting of the conditions, but I think that goes back to the point that was made earlier that this could potentially cause greater delays, especially for those complex projects. The Army Corps of Engineers and EPA provided technical uh, comments on the bill. They raised concerns that automatic permitting could lead to permits that are inconsistent with the requirements of the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act. This could lead to a violation of uh, federal statutes. Does, doesn't it make, does it make sense for, uh, for the, a permit to be granted that could be in violation of federal statutes? Don't you think that could be problematic? That would be problematic. I would think so. Um, we empower these agencies to assess the impacts of a project, set appropriate terms and conditions to protect uh, the public interest in public health. And I think what has been established in the hearing today is that from 2009 to 2012, FERC has approved 69 major natural gas pipeline projects spanning over 3,000 miles in 30 states with a capacity of nearly 30 billion cubic feet per day. Uh, Ninety percent of the permits are granted within a 12-month period. Uh, Commissioner, you testified there are a wide range of projects uh, that you would encourage companies to take greater advantage of pre-filing. Maybe we should be focused on how we encourage that to happen. Uh, we have testimony in the record now that this bill could result in greater delays uh, due to facts that denials are mandated. Uh, so I think on, on balance we have work to do here. There is a very important balance between uh, making sure infrastructure is permitted and improved in the most efficient way, but it's got to be balanced against the health and safety standards, and I think uh, uh, this, this draft legislation just has not uh, risen to the occasion. It is, it, I think it's it, based on the evidence in the record, it could create greater problems. And I know that's not the intent of the author. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to yield. Or not, and whether or not the Federal Clean Water or Clean Air Act is being 
Well, we wouldn't issue the permit uh, in place of the state. Well, we've we've been in that situation before, where a state has uh, delayed, like the Clean Water Act permit for a pipeline, and we have deemed the application complete, subject to that being resolved. Thank you, and Mr. Dingle, I think you. This also highlights a concern that that it could lead to much greater litigation. And this might be uh, a great new employment act for, for uh, environmental litigators out there. Thank you, and I'll yield back. <laughs> Gentlelady's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and Commissioner Mueller. It's good to see you again. Welcome. Thank you. I hope you celebrate the 4th of July with your family. I did. Great. And speaking of celebration, America has a lot to celebrate in 2013. Because we had a turning point in our country's history. For the first time in my 50 years on this planet, we can actually become energy independent. We're finding new oil and new gas places all over America that 10 years ago would have never been called energy states. North Dakota, the Bakken Shale Play, is the best example of that. Back home in Texas, shale plays seem to be doubling size with each passing year. It's truly remarkable. And the benefits extend beyond the oil patch. I've seen it firsthand along the Rio Grande River in the Eagleford Shale Play. Local school districts there do not have revenue to compete, did not have revenue to compete for admission to America's best universities. But now, with the revenue the school districts are getting with all the oil and gas development from the Eagleford Shale Play, instead of floppy disks, these kids have laptops. They have iPads. They have a future. But all that development, all that, that progress will stop if we allow those resources to stay stranded at the wellhead. Bureaucrats, dither, and the professional plaintiffs in the environmental community are looking to crank up lawsuits and take care, get involved with reviews of safe, important projects and grind them to a halt. That needs to stop, and that is why I'm so thankful that we have this conversation today. And I have a handful of questions for you on pipeline infrastructure and permitting in the United States. And in the tradition of Chairman Dingle, I'll ask you to answer a few questions with either yes or no answers. First question, do you agree that we're relying on natural gas more today than ever before in our modern energy history? I agree, yes. Yes, sir. Do you agree that increasing shale gas supply and increased use of natural gas for power generation are causing a need for new pipeline infrastructure? Yes. Do you agree that infrastructure bottlenecks can contribute to or even cause a reliability crisis? Yes. Does, the fact, does that fact make timely consideration of new or expanded pipelines for regulators even more important? Yes. Okay, no more yes or no questions, but as yet, I hear complaints. Even at church this past Sunday from an employee of one of our oil companies, our power generators, about the time of reviews with regulations, some regulators, regulators. FERC has heard from groups with names like Stop the Pipeline and No Gas Pipelines, dedicated to flooding your agency with sometimes trivial comments on individual pipelines. Knowing that, do you agree that some members of the environmental community have made it their mission to slow your good work? Well, I don't know if it's their mission. Um, there's a de big debate going on out there, but as I said earlier, you need the infrastructure, the pipes and wires to get the energy to people for them to enjoy it, uh, contribute to their quality of life. One more commis question, Commissioner. When FERC is considering a pipeline application, I know that you do all the lengthy reviews to ensure you meet all of your statutory requirements under the Natural Gas Act. However, I'd like to know how you work with pipeline operators and project developers on their needs. Specifically, if a project has to be completed in a certain time frame, 
to guarantee reliability or meet some contractual deadline, does FERC have a way to take that into account? Everyone would like their project done as soon as possible. So we have to balance the uh, complexity of the project with the economic issues and uh, try and do the best we can to get a thorough uh, analysis of, of the application. Is there a way that we could involve the contractor to get these considerations involved in the process without impacting the quality of your reviews? I think uh, emphasizing the pre-filing process that we talked about earlier. Okay, I'd some question on that, but I understand you hammered that, so I yield back to balance my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and I believe that concludes the questions for this first panel. I think Mr. Murphy is here to introduce uh, mm -hmm. someone on the second panel. Uh, so, uh, Chairman Moeller, I mean, Mr. Moeller, thank you for being with us today, and Mr. Wright, we appreciate your being with us as well. Uh, we do value your uh, comments and answers to our questions, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward. So, thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you and for inviting us. Dismissed at this time. Now, I'd like to call up the the uh, second panel of witnesses. Uh, I'm going to introduce all of them except the gentleman that Mr. Murphy's going to introduce. First, we have Mr. David Markarian, who's Vice President of Government Affairs for Next Era Energy. We have Ms. Maya Van Rosen, who is the Delaware Riverkeeper, Delaware Riverkeeper Network. We have Mr. Rick Kessler, who's the President of the Pipeline Safety Trust. And we have Mr. Donald Santa, who's President and CEO of INGA. And uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Murphy for the purpose of an introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I uh, want to introduce uh, Mr. Alex Paris, who's a good friend and a constituent of mine from Avella, Pennsylvania. Mr. Paris is a southwestern, southwestern Pennsylvania success story. His company, founded by his grandfather, I think, in 1928, has its roots in coal mining and road building. Today, it's a full-service, heavy construction firm employing hundreds of workers and laying thousands of miles of pipelines and helping to promote the safe development and secure transmission of natural gas from the Marcellus Shale, which is now the country's most productive shale play. My district is experiencing an economic revival because of the Marcellus Shale, which sits almost exclusively on privately held lands. But regulatory and permitting pipeline barriers are restricting job growth, especially in gas-poor regions of the country that stand to benefit from access to Pennsylvania's natural gas. Those regions need gas to power their factories, provide the feedstock for important chemicals, heat their homes, and basically keep the lights on. As Mr. Parrish will explain, the passage of the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act could help to address this challenge and spur billions in new economic activity. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman, and I now uh, turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, and uh, I want to welcome all of the members of this uh, second panel. Uh, we do look forward to your uh, testimony, and uh, each one of you will be given five minutes for an opening statement, and Mr. Markarian will begin with you, so uh, uh, you're, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee, Dave Markarian, Vice President of Governmental Affairs for Next Era Energy, Inc., also known as Florida Power and Light, for many years here in town. And I appreciate the opportunity to appear today and testify in favor of this bill. Next Era is one of America's leading energy companies, 15,000 employees. We operate one of the most diverse fleets in the U.S. Natural gas, solar, wind, nuclear, coal, and other fuels to generate electricity every day for millions of Americans. We're engaged in hydro hydraulic fracturing in many of the shales across the U.S. We build pipeline. We build long-distance, high-voltage transmission lines. We operate the fourth largest nuclear fleet in the U.S. with uh, commercial nuclear facilities in Florida, New Hampshire, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Now, to the point, in the last five years alone, NextEra Energy has invested $27 billion in American infrastructure for this industry. That puts us in the top ten of folks that have come uh, forward and put their money on, bet on this American economy. These projects have created thousands and thousands of jobs and uh, improved our ability to take advantage of domestic sources of fuels to generate electricity here at home. These are key ingredients not just for supplying electricity but for economic growth. 
One of the things that we have done the most of is to invest in natural gas. Now, we are probably better known as the largest wind energy company in the U.S., the second largest in the world or the largest in solar. But the fact that we are sitting here today, we heard Chairman Upton talk about this bill having bipartisan support. This reflects, our presence here reflects that the support for this bill goes across fuel sources. So for a company like ours that uses everything, uh, we are actually proud to, to, to sit here today and say that use of natural gas is saving customers across America uh, billions of dollars, by just our company alone, by investing in natural gas over the last uh, so many years. We have reduced our import and use of foreign oil by 98 percent. Our customer bills are 25 percent below the national average. Our Florida utility, which is about half of our business, serves about half of our state, about 9 million folks. Uh, and this is the key thing, delivers lower electricity prices, which does a few things. One, it encourages businesses to locate, grow, or move uh, to our areas where we, we serve. It gives people more money in their pocket so they can do more with it. It spurs economic growth. It spurs spending. It spurs saving and investment. Uh, if you've flown in and out of Fort Lauderdale, over the airport, we've got that classic uh, smokestack configuration Tuesday morning, 6.45 a.m. We blow those babies up and we build a, a brand new facility that will burn natural gas. A billion dollars of our money will save our customers $400 million just in the life of the plant. So we believe that it is really important to look ahead and get this fuel from where it is harnessed to where it is needed. And I have heard uh, the comments today, and I think the point, next era's support of this bill isn't so much for today, it is for the future, it is for the next 20 and 30 years. Our industry plans. 20, 25, 30 years out. And I wasn't alive during the Eisenhower administration, but they built a highway system. But I was alive for Gemini and Apollo. And if this industry doesn't rise to the level of national priority yet, I th and I think it will. And so we have to get ready for it. We have to keep pace with this renaissance that we know is on the way. And I think what this bill does is it, set it sets expectations. It requires that people in agencies think about staffing, that folks in Washington think about funding for staffing, and that everybody has a, an expectation of review that is certain. Now, I said in my testimony that sometimes uh, a definite no is better than in, an interminable maybe, and I think that that is true. Uh, if you are if you're going to do what we do for a living, sometimes it's good to know that you're not going to get it done and you move in a different direction. So there's four basic reasons why, in summary, we support this. Uh, one, this is a, a great opportunity for us. Uh, two, we think it's going to spur the economy. Three, it's helping to save customers money. And four, it helps us move things from where they uh, are harnessed to where we need it. I also want to point out that uh, the EEI, the Edison Electric Institute, which we are a member of, also supports this bill. And uh, there is wide industry support for the bill, and they filed a letter in support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Markarian. And uh, Ms. Van Rosen, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning. My name is Maya Van. Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, push the button to make sure it is on. Sorry. Good morning. My name is Maya Van Rossum. I'm the Delaware Riverkeeper, and my organization is the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And I really appreciate the time to speak with you this morning about HR 1900. And I'm actually here to ask you to please re rethink the proposal, to rethink HR 1900, and not send it to the floor. HR 1900 will diminish critical protections for our communities and our environment, and it will have unintended consequences. Ensuring full and fair environmental reviews and permitting of pipelines is critical because of the enormity of the potential environmental impact from these projects. For example, just one portion of one recent pipeline as it passes through the Delaware River watershed will impact 450 acres of land, cross 90 water bodies and 136 wetlands, and cut through two state-preserved forests. By imposing an inflexible reduction in the time allowed for Clean Water Act 401 and 404 permitting or decision making, H.R. 1900 could compel the states and the Army Corps to deny more applications rather than work with applicants to remedy deficiencies and improve their projects. Or alternatively, they could overlook deficiencies and issue legally dubious approvals. 
Our experience is that currently states will work with pipeline applicants to cure application deficiencies so as to ensure a fully informed 401 review. The time limitations in H.R. 1900 would inhibit such cooperation. The H.R. 1900 timeline will also diminish the time available for states to develop conditions necessary to support 401 certification, resulting in either further denials or the issuance of certifications unsuited to protecting our water quality. More 401 denials necessarily results in more 404, uh, denials of 404 permits. To avoid the administrative stress of H.R. 1900, some states may opt to simply waive their 401 authority altogether, depriving them of a critical opportunity to prevent degradation of their waters. Given that 401 certification may be the only way that a state can assure its water quality standards are met with regards to pipeline projects, H.R. 1900's interference with the exercise of this authority is an interference with the rights of states to protect their communities. H.R. 1900 may even encourage deficient applications in the hopes that its timing restrictions prevents full and careful review by the agencies. And if FERC is unable to obtain the detailed surveys, expert reports, and data analysis necessary to comply with NEPA in H.R. 1900's one-year time frame, FERC could be forced to choose between deficient NEPA reviews or denying the certificate of public convenience and necessity. By truncating the time allowed for environmental reviews, H.R. 1900 incentivizes the illegal practice of project segmentation. Segmentation prevents the understanding of the full impacts of a pipeline project and the need for specific prote pr protections. Segmentation is already common practice for pipeline projects. H.R. 1900 diminishes the ability of agencies to identify and stop the practice. And a look at the pipeline map that we have provided for you with our testimony um, if you look at the top where the arrow is, the red and the yellow line towards the top is two approved projects. One was authorized in May of 2010. The other was authorized in May of 2012. And it is very clear by even casual observation and the timing of these reviews that these two proposals are in fact one project that should have been reviewed and decided upon uh, as a single project, not two. So that demonstrates you know, how segmentation plays out. H.R. 1900 reduces environmental protection by reducing environmental reviews and the time allowed for creating appropriate conditions. As such, if this piece of legislation is to move forward, it must be balanced by legislation that ensures the use of best construction practices and planning in order to ensure avoidance of environmental harm. Examples of enhanced practices, reduced right-of-way widths to more historic proportions that are mandatory. A mandate that public lands protected with community resources are avoided. Use of construction strategies that avoid and reverse soil compaction. Compaction at pipeline construction sites can be as high as 98%. Earthen jams are generally only compa compacted to 95%. The increased runoff, pollution, potential flooding, and failed restoration that results could be avoided by better construction practices, such as using excavated soils and wood chips from felled trip trees to create the construction bed for operating heavy equi equipment. And sh FERC should have a duty to ensure coordinated location of pipeline projects as part of its review, similar as, as uh, its obligation with respect to hydroelectric dams. Coordinated planning for pipeline projects would better serve the public interest and help avoid redundant and, un redundant and unnecessary projects. So I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and I respectfully ask that you not move forward this proposed piece of legislation, but if you do, I ask that you balance its effect with necessary legislative upgrades regarding pipeline planning, reviews, and construction. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kessler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I, could I just be recognized for about 30 seconds? Yes, sir. I thank you for your courtesy. I want to commend uh, uh, Ms. Von Rossum for her very fine statement. And I want to like to welcome to the committee Mr. Rick Kessler, who is a personal friend, former staff member, wrote much of the energy legislation written by this committee during my chairmanship served with distinction in writing pipeline safety legislation and other matters. So we welcome an old friend back. Pleasure to see you, Mr. Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Dingle, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McInerney, and also you, Mr. Pompeo. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Um, 
My name is Rick Kessler, and I'm here in my voluntary uncompensated role as president of the Pipeline Safety Trust, which, as you know, is the only national independent nonprofit solely focused on pipeline safety. I'm here to let you know of the trust's concerns and opposition to H.R. 1900 in its current form. The bill would add two new subsections loosely based on current regulation to Section 7 of the Natural Gas Act in an effort to expedite FERC's certification process, which, as we've, all, we've heard from FERC, is pretty fast to begin with. There are many reasons, though, why a FERC certificate may not be complete within a year time frame. These include the complexities involved with studying the impact of a pipeline on environmentally sensitive areas or on dense urban areas requiring substantial public involvement or the mere lack of funds available to an agency to adequately staff FERC's NEPA review process. This latter reason will no doubt grow as sequestration takes greater hold on our budget. Frankly, we see no policy rationale for the bill's one-size-fits-all one-year limit that would treat a 10-mile pipeline across a barren desert the same as a 1,400-mile pipeline that runs through multiple ecosystems in dense urban areas. Uh, in fact, this new limitation seems to run counter to the recent GAO report that studied the natural gas permitting process and found that the average time for those projects that began at the application phase was 225 days. But to be clear, our opposition to H.R. 1900 relates primarily to the new subsection that would deem to approve any licenses, permits, or quote-unquote approvals related to an application for a certificate of public convenience and necessity if the agency considering the application doesn't act within the 90 to 120 day uh, time frame of FERC's issuance of its final environmental document. It would do this regardless of when the agency receives the permit or the license application. We note that the bill contains no requirement that such application be complete and contain the necessary information for the reviewing agency. Even the recent Inga Foundation report found that many of the causes for delays are due to issues wholly within the control of the applicants, not the permitting agencies. In those cases, it would be impossible for an agency to complete its review of a complex route-dependent permit within the allotted time frame, making permit issuance under H.R. 1900 a potential fait accompli and effectively gutting the important role these agencies play in protecting public health, safety, and the environment. We also note that Current regulation, while setting a 90-day deadline, also includes an exemption for timelines set by other federal law, yet no such exemption exists in H.R. 1900. We would additionally point out that almost no company has pursued the remedy provided to industry under current law, yet now the industry is arguing for the significant change to EPAC 2005 without even availing itself of the avenues it currently has to address the problem. And as others have pointed out, ironically, it is possible that this could slow progress on approval of pipeline projects by leaving agencies no choice but to deny permits, uh, particularly at the state level, which uh, are often even more strapped for money than the feds. Perhaps most significantly, Section 7 of the Natural Gas Act is unique in that it provides for the granting of federal eminent domain authority to natural gas pipeline companies. Subsection 7H of current law allows these companies in certain circumstances to take private land to build an interstate natural gas pipeline upon the grant of a certificate of public convenience and necessity. The trust believes that the taking of private land by corporations or any other entity is an extremely serious matter and shouldn't be taken lightly in law or in practice. In our view, no process or part of the process should be curtailed or deemed approved when takings are involved. Unfortunately, this legislation would do just that. Ultimately, the trust failed to see any compelling case for this legislation. Natural gas pipeline construction has grown and will only continue to grow as a result of the increased development of unconventional shale gas around the country. Any perceived strain, uh, sorry, any perceived strain on FERC and related agency consideration is due to the success, not the failure, of the growth of natural gas pipeline transmission. Absent new financial resources, in fact, the increase in new pipeline plans will likely put a strain on the ability of agencies at the federal and state level to review these pipeline plans as quickly as companies and their investors want. However, that shouldn't be an excuse to cut corners, shortchange landowners, and put at risk the public and our environment. Thank you for your attention to our concerns. As you know, the trust does not oppose the construction of new pipelines in general. 
Rather, we advocate to ensure that new and existing pipelines are as safe as they can be for the sake of property owners, the environment, and the public welfare. You've heard from us before about the inadequacy of the Federal Pipeline Safety Program. We believe that this legislation, by short-circuiting the review and permitting process on numerous levels, would deal a major blow to pre-construction review of new lines, increasing first future risk to the public and the environment. We urge the committee to take the time necessary to fully review the situation before scheduling the bill for a full committee mm -hmm. markup. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kessler, thanks. Uh, Mr. Paris, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield and members of the subcommittee, my name is Alex Paris. I'm president of Alex Paris Contracting. Our offices are located in Atlasburg, Pennsylvania, which is about two miles from the first Marcellus well. We provide a variety of construction services throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, including natural gas pipeline construction. Last year, we installed about 350,000 feet of pipe, mainly in the Marcellus and Utica shale plays in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio. Because of development in these shale plays, we've had to increase our employee base dramatically, as well as purchase a substantial amount of equipment. While we perform a significant amount of midstream work, we also work on gas distribution pipeline systems. I'm here today on behalf of the Distribution Contractors uh, Association, which represents contractors who work primarily in the gas industry. I'm pleased to speak to you this morning about the natural gas pipeline permitting process, which unfortunately often results in considerable delays in getting important projects off the ground. The Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Act would effectively address this problem by authorizing FERC to enforce approval deadlines subject to other federal agencies involved in the permitting process. It is evident that we have, have enough natural gas to meet America's growing energy needs for generations to come, which is a blessing. However, many parts of the country do not have the necessary pipeline infrastructure to meet the rising demand. Many more pipeline projects will need it to be achieved will be needed to achieve that capacity. Gas pipeline projects create high paying jobs and generate significant economic activity. On top of that, tax revenue generated by natural gas production comes at a time when states and local communities need it most. In 2011, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue reported that companies engaged in natural gas drilling activities paid more than $1.1 billion in state taxes since 2006. Last year, nationwide production and transportation of gas added $62 billion to federal and state government revenues, and it could elevate to $111 billion by 2020. I've seen these economic impacts up close over the past few years in my home state of Pennsylvania. In 2008, I employed about 250 people. I currently employ about 450, about a 20 percent increase per year. We are constantly hiring and training new employees to meet our project needs. In fact, on a recent project, we had to add about 60 more people to the job because of schedule compressed due to permitting issues. Economic benefits that accompany natural gas pipeline projects aren't limited to hiring workers. Last year, my company purchased an additional $16 million worth of trucks and equipment, and I can honestly attribute all of this to the recent boom in natural gas production and transportation. I have had an opportunity to see firsthand both the economic and social impact of natural gas development. We have also witnessed many problems that occur when permits are delay, delayed. This includes layoffs, equipment being idled, and negative impacts to property owners. I would like to point out that our company has an opportunity to work in a vast variety of industries with many different and with many different government entities. I have never seen an industry like the gas industry. Its commitment to the environment and to doing projects the right way is unparalleled. They spend the money and dedicate the resources necessary to address environmental concerns and build safe pipeline systems that, to, that meet the latest and highest standards. I have had an opportunity to be part of this and I am very proud of it. Unfortunately, important pipeline projects are often stall, stalled because of extended reviews and while they, while they acquire federal and state permits. Permit Delays are a big problem. We live this almost every day, often resulting in missed in-service dates and increased project costs. My company is currently experiencing permit delays on several projects, one of which we were not able to obtain the uh, permits for the last 8,000 feet of a project. That project ended up being delayed and in all likelihood will be rebid. 
In a recent study, Pennsylvania conduct, a recent study conducted in Pennsylvania determined that permit delays are averaging 150 days, and most of them are for minor wetland and stream crossings. The bottom line is that delays in acquiring pipeline permits regularly cause downstream delays, which in the end impacts the consumer. Understanding the significant job creation and the economic activity that result from gas pipeline projects, DCA strongly supports the legislation to streamline the permitting process. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this morning and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Paris. And Mr. Santa, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Whitfield, uh, Mr. McNerney, and members of the Subcommittee on Energy and Power. My name is Donald Santa, and I'm the President and CEO of the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, or INGA. INGA represents interstate natural gas transmission pipeline operators in the U.S. and Canada. Thank you for the opportunity to share INGA's views on H.R. 1900, the Natural Gas Pipeline Permitting Reform Act. INGA supports H.R. 1900. If enacted, this bill would perfect the provisions of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 that were intended to provide the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with the ability to coordinate the actions of other federal and state agencies that have authority under federal law to issue permits required for the construction of natural gas pipelines. As part of this coordination, EPAC 2005 authorized FERC to establish deadlines for action by other federal and state agencies that must issue permits in connection with a FERC-approved pipeline. EPAC 2005, however, did not provide FERC with any authority to enforce such deadlines. Further, the remedy provided in that law, a lawsuit against the offending agency brought in a federal appellate court by the pipeline applicant, has proven to be ineffective. H.R. 1900 would remedy this problem by requiring that the federal or state permitting agency must act within 90 days after FERC issues its environmental impact statement or environmental assessment pursuant to NEPA. 90 days is the period prescribed by the regulations adopted by FERC to implement EPAC 2005. Should the permitting agency fail to act within the 90 days, H.R. 1900 would have the license, permit, or approval go into effect by operation of law. This change in the law is needed because, notwithstanding the intent of EPAC 2005, it now takes longer than before for an applicant to receive the permits and approvals required to commence constructing a FERC-approved pipeline. In particular, a report prepared by Holland and Knight and sponsored by the Inga Foundation examined a sample of 51 pipeline projects from both before and after EPAC 2005. The re report found more than a three-fold increase in the permits that were delayed more than 90 days after the issuance of the FERC NEPA document, and a more than five-fold increase in the permits that were delayed for yet another 90 days beyond the initial 90-day period. The report found that reasons for the delays varied and could be addressed partly by process improvements on the part of both the permitting agencies and the applicants. Still, the top recommendation from the report was schedule enforceability. Inga's goal in supporting H.R. 1900 is to encourage permitting agencies to make timely decisions by providing a real enforcement mechanism. With this enforcement, as contained in H.R. 1900, Inga believes that permitting agencies will be strongly motivated to make timely decisions. Why should Congress care about the timely permitting for natural gas pipelines? Congress should care because pipelines are critical to enabling U.S. consumers to take advantage of the substantial new domestic natural gas supplies. The central role of natural gas in our nation's energy future was noted by President Obama in his June 25th speech at Georgetown University. The President said in part, quote, sometimes there are disputes about natural gas, but let me say this, we should strengthen our position as the top natural gas producer because in the medium term at least, it not only can provide safe, cheap energy, but it can also reduce our carbon emissions, close quote. The President went on to say, quote, the bottom line is natural gas is producing jobs. It's lowering many families' heat and power bills, close quote. 
Without pipelines, natural gas supplies remain in the ground, and consumers in capacity-constrained markets experience greater price volatility and higher than average natural gas prices. Mr. Chairman, members of INGA thank, thank Representative Pompeo and the co-sponsors of H.R. 1900 for introducing this legislation and the subcommittee for inviting testimony on the bill. If enacted, this bill will make an incremental but important change that will increase the likelihood that the U.S. fully realizes the benefits of abundant domestic natural gas. Well, Ms. Sanda, thank you and thank all of you for your testimony. As I said in the beginning, we appreciate your being here to give us your views on H.R. 1900. Uh, I think it goes without saying that this is a particularly important uh, uh, piece of legislation, and I know all of us will have questions, and I would recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, we've all talked about the abundant natural resources that we have in America with these recent discoveries, and we do know that there's going to be an increased application numbers for uh, the gas line pipelines. <clears throat> It appears that on this panel, two of you are probably opposed to this, are opposed to this legislation, and three of you, I'm assuming, support this legislation. And uh, one of the key issues here is this uh, schedule enforceability. And Mr. Santa, in your testimony, you talked about, you gave an example of the Corps of Engineers and the Natural Resources uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service on a water permit, you gave a good example of a permit that was delayed uh, an unreasonable length of time in my view. And I want, it, I want you to comment on it because uh, that is the kind of real life situation that we deal with. Now 90 percent of these permits are uh, either are approved or disapproved within the time constraints of the existing law. But there, there are real consequences, uh, certainly on both sides of the issue, uh, when a, a permit is delayed. And you, in the example you gave, it increased the cost of this project by 6 percent, I believe. Would you elaborate just a little bit on that project and the delay caused by the Corps of Engineers and the Natural, uh, Na National Resource Conservation Service? It was a uh, relatively short project, uh, 20 miles of pipeline. I believe it was relatively small diameter pipe. Uh, but nonetheless, notwithstanding uh, uh, having the FERC, FERC process having worked very well, uh, dealing with the Corps and the other agency uh, added quite a bit of delay. That added cost for the applicant, uh, likely cost for those who were the customers of the pipeline. To the extent the pipeline is going to provide additional gas supplies to that community, it uh, d delayed the benefit of that. Uh, I think it's, as I, you said, Mr. Chairman, an example of the type of a delay that uh, this bill would provide a powerful incentive for the agencies to act in a timely manner so that these facilities could be built. Now, can any of you think of a better way to encourage these agencies that have this 90 days to either approve or deny permit? Can you think of a better enforcement mechanism than what Mr. Pompeo sets out in his legislation. Is there some other way that it could be done to encourage timely action? Good morning. This is Maya Van Rossum. Um, with all due respect, there already is an opportunity. Um, in the 2005 Energy uh, Protection Act, there is the opportunity to go to the courts and seek a remedy through the courts. The fact that even um, in Inga's own report, they uh, document that the pipeline companies have chosen not to avail themselves of this remedy does not mean that it is not a fair, adequate, full, complete, and available remedy for them. And in fact, going to the courts is also the remedy that's available to um, environmental organizations and community organizations and citizens and residents who feel that they have been disenfranchised by the process, perhaps for different reasons. So just with all due respect, I would say that there is a remedy available to the pipeline companies. They simply have chosen not to avail themselves to, to take advantage of it. And I would say if they were to pursue, pursue these legal actions through the decisions that come out of each of these court cases, precedent would be set. And it would be the precedent that would mandate quicker or shorter, more um, 
thoughtful or less thoughtful decision making by the agencies. But that's really the path forward, mm -hmm. we believe, rather than legislation that, that takes away the rights of the agencies and the community to fully participate. Has your, agen has your uh, agency ever filed a lawsuit to stop a project? Ms. Um, we have filed, uh, we are engaged in legal action because we are actually concerned about the deficiency of the reviews and permitting that have been undertaken by FERC and by the state of Pennsylvania for the Northeast Upgrade Project pursued by the Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company. So it's not a legal action about stopping the project. It's a legal action about making sure that the law has been complied with and that the project only moves forward in, in a safe manner for the environment. For so the you have a lawsuit against FERC today? Yes, we do. Okay. We have legal action in the okay. courts today. Mr. Time is oh, yes, Mr. I'm Sanger. Sorry. Could I respond on the point about the, the effectiveness of the legal remedy provided under the law today? As, as we note in the testimony, it, it is somewhat self-defeating for a pipeline to go and sue the agency from which it is seeking to get a, a favorable permit. But probably more importantly, the one instance in which a pipeline company availed itself of the appellate rights provided under EPAC 2005, I think illustrates that, it was the Islander East project it uh, sought review of the denial of a clean water permit by the state of Connecticut. So not in action by the, the state, but nonetheless denial of a permit. It took Islander East uh, one year and three months to get review from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, to get a decision remanding the case to the Connecticut DEP. It took Islander East a total of two years and ten months and two more trips back to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit to get the final word, which ultimately was upholding the state on denying the permit. So I think with that as the track record of utilizing the appellate process under EPAC 2005, you can see why pipelines have not been eager to do this. Thank you, Mr. Santa. Uh, Mr. McNerney, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has been a pretty beneficial hearing. I, I think uh, it's brought out there's legitimate concerns on both sides. Uh, of this uh, piece of legislation, so I appreciate the, the testimony. In my mind, the bottom line is this. Uh, are firm deadlines going to be beneficial overall, or are firm deadlines going to be detrimental, taking into account public safety uh, and uh, per the uh, possible denial of uh, what would be legitimate projects? So uh, I'd like to just acknowledge that, uh, that this is not a, an easy question to answer, yes or no. I think we should uh, take time and, and uh, look at this in a more deliberate manner than just bringing it up for markup this afternoon. That's my opinion, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Paris, uh, you, you've mentioned uh, what you've referred to as permit delays. Has your business participated in the pre-permitting process uh, at FERC, and has that been beneficial? No, no, as a contractor, we typically wouldn't be involved in that. The pipeline company would be. So the permit delays are generally uh, with within the pipeline company that's constructed that we're working for the construct we're, that we're constructing the line for. Well, you, uh, I, I would I would just uh, recommend that that approach be taken. It might uh, ease that sort of burden that you're facing. Um, but this bill does set a 12-month deadline uh, on FERC decide to decide applications for gas pipeline cert uh, certificates. There's no flexibility. There's no exceptions. Uh, FERC has to decide, decide every application within one year. During that year, the entire environmental review required by NEPA would have to be completed. Uh, Ms. Rosam, do you think that 12 months is enough time to complete those kinds of uh, uh, permits uh, on complex projects? In terms of NEPA, where the, the 12 months in H.R. 1900 would, would apply, absolutely. Um, feel that there are numerous projects where 12 months would, would not be appropriate, especially if you're not assuring that the time that the clock begins at the time when there's a complete an administratively complete application before the agency. In terms of the state agencies and the federal agencies, the, the 90, potentially 120-day time frame, again, the volume of information and analysis that has to be undertaken um, to review a project, to put in place to condi conditions, to, to look at the, the, to collect the data and the research of geological resources and water bodies that will be impacted and what kind of ENS controls. It's a very time-intensive process, and I do Thank not believe those time frames are enough. Uh, well, I mean, it's clear that we must remember that doing a good job reviewing a proposed natural gas pipeline could have serious impacts 
And we're not only talking about environmental uh, impacts, but um, I don't live too far from the San Bruno explosion that happened a few years ago in, San, in, in, the, in the San Francisco Peninsula. Uh, there's very serious consequences with engineering review uh, deficiencies as well. Um, and I, I'd like to, to, to see if any of you, uh, Mr. McCary in particular, have concerns about uh, possible consequences of bad engineering and uh, environmental reviews uh, if, if there's an imposed deadline that doesn't permit the agencies to do sufficient work. Well. I think it's critically important that we do the things we need to do correctly and we not squander this great opportunity to advance our nation forward on the back of natural gas. However, I do think that a, a year's time is enough if we – I think we all worry about what government does well and efficiently. And I think we have to raise the bar and set expectations that things need to be done uh, according to a schedule. And if they can't, a rejection, a no, is, is certainly understandable. This will produce certain no's, and I think that's favorable to an interminable maybe. Well, I, I, I guess I don't disagree, but I mean, I think the question is, is imposing these strict deadlines, is that going to be beneficial or not? It's not clear to me that we can answer that question in one hearing. It's not clear to me that we should move forward with the markup today until we get some better answers on these questions. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. Uh, Ms. Pompeo, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all the uh, witnesses for coming out and testifying today. I, I want to just keep going on the direction you were headed, Mr. McCarran. and you talked about the, the risk of no. Uh, we've heard from members. Uh, today that there's this risk that the agencies will just say no because they ran the clock out. We've heard from uh, Ms. Russell and Mr. Kessler that risk. Um, but all the folks who have to go out and raise capital and operate in this environment seem to think that that risk is worth taking because it creates certainty for them so they can deliver a uh, high-quality product at a low cost and good value to their customers. So you all got to the places, did Inga, that says, hey, that risk, which I think is low, but nonetheless out there, um, how did you get there? How did you get comfortable that that is better off for you and for your customer service area uh, than uh, this risk of just being hung out for uh, an indefinite period of time? Because uh, planning is critical and meeting the expectations of a plan is critical. And let's not forget, we have done great things as Americans. And when we work together, we, what your bill does is it ups our game. It says, everybody, whether we're concerned about the environment or safety or getting things done, everybody ups their game and commits to a time schedule. And you actually have a little bit of wiggle room, too, in the bill, that if it can't be done in a, in a year, you've got some extra time. So I think what we're focused on, you know, we've been through some tough times, and we're focused on a gift that we can take advantage of, work together, up our game, make a commitment to each other that we're going to do it within a time limit and then stick to it. And you know what? If we've got to work a little harder, we've got to work weekends, we've got to work nights, we've got to work a 20-hour day, if that's what it takes, that's what we need to do because I really do believe the promise of this resource is, is that great. And, Mr. Green, too, you, you have another obligation. You have a service area obligation to provide reliable. You have agencies that are that are requiring you to meet a certain level of reliability and capacity and are constantly chasing you for rate ish on rate issues as well. I assume you think that HR 1800 would improve your capability to meet those other various commitments that your, that your company has as well. We do. Uh, Mr. Senator, this, uh, this risk of no due to timeline, um, Ms. Van Russen was talking about short-circuiting, I, I can't get the language right, but she, her concern was that the agencies would just say yes when they hadn't really completed the task. Do you, do you think that's the likely uh, administrative response to H.R. 1900? I think they have the potential, as has been noted, to say no. And I also think that when we're talking about the timelines here, while there's a focus on the 90 days and the 30-day extension, let's remember there's all that period before FERC issues the NEPA document. In that GAO report, they noted that for the projects that go through the pre-filing, those are the more complex, longer projects. Uh, typically, it's 558 days between initiation of pre-filing and the FERC certificate order. Mm -hmm. That's over a year and a half. Even if you back out and assume FERC takes 90 days between the EIS and the certificate order, 
that's still a year and three months of dialogue and engagement that has gone on between the applicant, the stakeholders, the resource agencies. So number one, I think there is the time to make those decisions. And also, I think, quite frankly, if those agencies are true to their statutory mandates and, and you know, the, what Congress has asked them to do, if they need to say no, they will say no. And, and as you noted, as Mr. Markarian noted, that's a risk that I think the industry is going to take. It's greater accountability on the part of the agencies, but also, quite frankly, it requires greater accountability on the part of the pipeline industry to file good applications. Right, and, and I, my, my expectation would be is if there, if there were to be the case that we started to get these no's, I think industry would respond to that in an appropriate way. They'd be more complete. They'd be more careful. They'd, they'd get these things done in more time. They're not going to sit there and allow uh, administrative no's to be made simply because um, of a failure on the part of the applicant. I don't think their shareholders would tolerate that. I think, that, I think that's probably right as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back the little bit of time left. The gentleman yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Kessler, you indicate in your testimony that in spite of your organization's work, we continue to experience major pipeline failures. In response to my question earlier to Mr. Mueller, he indicated that projects going through densely populated areas are more complex than those through more open areas. In an abbreviated process, are we likely to put more people at risk uh, given those situations? Absolutely. Um, and what role do safety considerations play now in pipeline uh, sightings? Uh, not enough from our perspective, but you know, when you're making decisions about routing, um, whether it's through urban areas or high hazard areas like earthquake zones, flood zones, things like that, uh, it's clearly a consideration. Um, I also think it's interesting that the industry, which has been very reluctant, in fact resistant, to mandatory deadlines for uh, safety inspections, who has argued against one size fits all for safety inspections, suddenly wants a one size fits all mandatory deadline for permitting. So um, it's a little, comes across a little strange to me. Mm -hmm. The, um, to what extent are concerns about safety involved in public opposition to pipeline projects? You know, you talk about this one size fits all for inspection. Is the public aware of that? And and what concerns, again, are, are, are safety involved in, in with public opposition to proposals? You know, public opposition occurs for a number of reasons, um, ranging from um, true safety or environmental concerns to just a lack of familiarity with, uh, with pipeline and uh, energy production. As we get more energy production in New York, uh, Maryland, where I live, um, and other non-traditional uh, production states, you are going to have a level of resistance to projects based upon a lack of familiarity. But you will also have them based upon safety and environmental concerns, uh, depth of coverage for burial of pipelines through streams, uh, running through uh, earthquake zones, running through densely populated areas, and rooting matters um, when you do these things. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Rossum, uh, we've heard the um, environmental review process um, response mentioned several times as the source of delays in, in um, approval of pipeline projects. Are communities, drinking water resources, agricultural and fishery resources part of the environmental review process? Are we only talking about habitats and areas of um, low public use? Yeah, when we're talking about the National Environmental Policy Act, we're not looking just at the ecological environment. We're looking at the human environment. So we are, in fact, looking at drinking water supplies, the quality of the, the air, the um, level of noise pollution that perhaps a compressor creates uh, next to residential communities to um, a wide variety of issues. So we are concerned about the, about the critters in the forest, but we're very much looking at the implications of what happens to the critters, to the forest, to the water, for what it means to the health the safety and the tremendous level of jobs um, that benefit people as a result of them. Okay, thank you. And is an expedited process um, likely to increase or reduce public confidence and or support for public uh, or for pipeline projects in your opinion? I think it will absolutely decrease it. I think there's already uh, concerns about um, the, the integrity of the process because there is uh, 
so much chumminess, frankly, between the regulators and the regulated when it comes to pipeline projects, and that already has raised a level of concern. And I think if we start imposing artificial deadlines and reducing the opportunity for the public to participate, with a, which a 90-day review period absolutely does, we will absolutely be diminishing public confidence as well as the process uh, as a whole. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Just for one day. Pardon me? I think oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kessel. I just wanted to add to my answer before that one of the reasons for the protest could involve the potential taking of private lands, and those landowners should have a right to process and to be able to argue against or, uh, a particular route that would affect them. So. Okay. All right. Thank you for that uh, added information. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and good afternoon and welcome to the witnesses. And before I get started with my questions, I want to share with y'all a real world story that happened about 40 hours ago about the importance of a thorough and expeditious permitting process to build new pipelines. As I said, 40 hours ago, I was at my church having a glass of water. I was approached by one of my fellow church, church members about the need to grow the pipeline infrastructure from the Euford Shale Play in South Central Texas to the refineries along the Texas Gulf Coast. He works downstream for a power generator, natural gas power generator. And his legitimate concern was that our current pipeline infrastructure would hurt his business. He, was, he thought the natural gas price would increase because of artificial, artificially limited supply because of a lack of pipelines. I think that's a very legitimate concern. So my first question is for you, Mr. Markarian. As you mentioned your testimony, Next Era has an extremely clean and diverse fleet. You've got gas, nuclear, coal, and wind. And we're very happy to have you operating in Texas. And on behalf of the people of Texas 22, I encourage you to build new plants in the Lone Star State. But of course, one key element of your fleet is your gas-fired plants, which not only provide reliable power themselves, but also help back up the highly variable wind. And when I say wind and power, I want to remind my colleagues that Texas is the number one producer of wind in America, number one. We discussed in this committee how reliability and access to fuel is different for coal plants or nuclear plants and as it is for natural gas plants. So can you discuss the differences between coal, nuclear, and natural gas plants for reliability? And is it fair to say that an efficient regulatory process for pipeline approvals like H.R. 1900 is key to keeping the lights on in many parts of our country? Sorry, it is key. We, uh, we actually have two giant gas plants, Forney and Lamar, in Texas, in Mr. Henserling's district. We believe we need all of these fuels. We are the Saudi Arabia of coal. We have a gift now of natural gas, by the way, made possible by the support of this Congress for policy that investigated in new, new technologies that ultimately yielded the ability to harness this. Uh, all forms of power need backup. And so we believe at Next Era we need all forms of energy and should encourage the development of all of it. And as far as Texas, it's a great place to do business. Yes, sir. You like that state income tax rate, right? Pretty close um, to zero. Yeah. You got it. Right. Yes, sir. How would you describe the overall current regulation? Do you say it's efficient? Regulation I do. Again, as I said, you know, there are, there are rules that apply to every one of us in this room and, and outside this room in this town. And if we follow the rules that are set up and work together to try to do things according to the timeline set forth, I think we all win. And, and on the contrary, <clears throat> if we don't work together, we all lose. Yep. We don't harness the electricity we can from natural gas. We don't sell it. We don't pull it up. We don't benefit the economy from it. So I think it behooves us to all work together. Yes, sir. In my state face a power crisis, let's be new power plants online sometime next year or two. If we have another heat wave like we had August of 2011, lights will go out all over the state. My final questions are for you, Mr. Santa. I mean, as you mentioned in your testimony, pipelines are multi-billion dollar investments. And when one of these projects is undertaken, the time becomes 
very important because investors have expectations as capital is tied up, like Mr. Pompeo alluded to. The shippers who produce gas and the end users who consume it need certainty for when that supply, for when that supply and demand can meet up. Can you discuss some of the ways in which delays to pipeline projects can hurt everyone up and down the pipe chain from the refine, from the getting out of the ground to the refinery, the whole supply chain, just like my fellow church member, worried about downstream, a power generating plant, worried about a pipeline from the Eagleford Shale Plain. Yes, Mr. Olson, I think this is illustrated by what happens in the market when you have got capacity constraints. This past winter in Boston, uh, prices at, at one point got to $34 uh, for MMBTU, while they were averaging a little above $4 in the rest of the country. That was largely due to pipeline constraints. So customers in that market were paying more because of pipeline constraints that were not relieved. Similarly, upstream, if there are constraints that hinder a producer in getting their gas to the market, they'll be forced to accept a lower price for that gas. That reduces their incentive to drill and to produce gas. So the, the uh, capacity constraints on the pipelines, the ability to relieve them in an efficient market responsive manner, it not only affects the pipeline companies, it affects gas consumers across the board. Gentlemen. Thank you. My time yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The uh, arbitrary deadlines established uh, by this bill raise serious concerns, but the worst provision may be the one that automatically grants environmental permits for a pipeline. Uh, the project uh, could be approved if an agency does not make a decision on the permit within 90 days of the issuance of FERC's environmental analysis. The automatic permitting provision broadly applies to the Clean Air Act, the, Drink, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, and the rights of way through federal lands. Under this bill, if an agency cannot complete its review of a permit application by the arbitrary 90-day deadline, then no one checks to make sure that the project won't have an adverse impact on the environment or public health. The permit is just magically issued. These permits are detailed documents. They can include emission limits, technology or operating requirements, conditions to ensure that the environment is protected. Agencies need to figure out all of these details and then actually draft the permits. Ms. Van Rossum, what would it mean for a permit that might not even be written to automatically take effect if a deadline is missed? How would that work? To be honest with you, I'm not sure how it would work. I don't know what is the permit or the approval that would go into effect. Perhaps it's just the applicant or the application, the way the applicant submitted it, no matter how deficient the application materials. So there's no, no um, clarity on that, frankly, the way the law is written. But one thing I will say is that it's probably assured that we won't have um, the, the limitations in the document necessary to ensure that water protection laws, air protection laws, coastal zone management laws are met. And as a result, those permits are imminently challengeable in the courts. So it's going to draw us all into the courtroom. Uh, let me give you a concrete uh, permitting example to understand the impacts of this provision. Uh, what is involved with an Army Corps of Engineers review of a wetlands permit under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and why is this review important? Yeah, so the, the Army Corps is working to protect the health and the, the, the quality of the wetlands. Wetlands are vitally important for protecting water quality, including the quality of drinking water supplies, for preventing, for soaking up waters that prevent flooding and flood damages, for protecting ecological systems that are important for supporting um, wonderful ecotourism jobs and recreational opportunities. So the work that the Army Corps does is beneficial to the wetlands, but it's beneficial to our community as a whole. In order to undertake that review, they need to look. Uh, they need to look carefully at the um, materials that have been submitted by the applicant to make sure that they're accurate. They need to go out in the field and do jurisdictional determinations. They need to collect information and data on the construction practices. What that if are they're going just to taking use. too long? We got a ninety. What is it? A ninety-day period, and they just haven't figured out to do all this in that period of time. What happens under this bill? 
And it's, that's what's not clear to us, frankly. We don't know what happens. We don't know what is the document that goes into force and effect. Perhaps it is simply the, the application materials that the permittee has put in, whatever quality and information that may or may not have. It's really not clear what it means yeah. to approve a non-existent hmm. document. Mr. Kessler, uh, what do you think? Is the Pipeline Safety Trust concerned about the safety implications of a host of permits automatically going into effect without any agency analysis or conditions? Oh, absolutely, Mr. Waxman. Um, look, we, we certainly would love to see the, license, the uh, certification process be more efficient. We have no objection to that. But we don't think that a deemed approval um, or a, an undue denial of a permit is, is good public policy in any way, shape, or form. This is why we have agencies to actually look into these things. I would note that this committee, after 9-11, you will recall, and, uh, Mr. and Chairman Whitfield will recall, uh, did extensive work bipartisan on nuclear safety, and we found that there was a two-year backlog in FBI um, review of security uh, well, what would be the permits? And what I don't would think be anyone uh, argued because that because you know what this committee is like, and yeah. member only has a limited amount of time. What if we have this automatic permit, and then it results in damage to the environment and public health? What is this going to do to the public acceptance of interstate natural gas pipelines going through their communities? Oh, it's going to hurt them greatly, I think. And as I said, no one would have argued for a deemed approval of a security uh, permit after 9-11 if it took longer than six months or a year. So same thing with immigration. Even the most ardent supporter of open immigration wouldn't, I think, argue for a deemed approval of a green card. Thank you. My time is time's oh, expired. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that uh, a technical analysis provided to us from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers perspective be put into the record as well. Is this the same thing? as well as a, a technical analysis by the Environmental Protection Agency. Without objection. Thank you. This time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I am intrigued, uh, uh, Ms. Van Rossum, in answering one of uh, uh, Chairman Emeritus uh, uh, Waxman's questions. Uh, you were getting excited is, is a good thing to do when you're discussing the public uh, events. And you indicated that one of the provisions of this bill would, would just draw us all into the courtroom as if that were a negative thing. And yet earlier in the testimony, you indicated that that was the remedy for folks who had a problem with what was going on, uh, that they could go into the courtroom uh, and that that was a good thing and they didn't need this bill and this remedy because they had the courts available to them. And I'm wondering if you can rectify the two. Is it good or is it bad to be pulled into the courtroom? Well, it's, it's always important to have the courts as an opportunity to remedy a real problem that exists. And so if we find ourselves in a situation where the law is automatically approving documents that are non-existent or are imminently deficient because the agencies did not have the opportunity to complete them, then absolutely, the remedy is to go into courts. But that's going to be a much more frequently required remedy than what we have in the current situation. We've had many, many um, yes, folks' I, I, and testimony I, about and how I many applicants that. are I, I approved. Don't, I don't think, I think the distinction personally is, is that it depends on whose ox is being gored. The courts are good when it's somebody else's ox, or bad when the courts are oxing your or goring your ox, but when it's uh, somebody else's ox, that's a great place to go. No, it's about me, intentionally me, I, creating. I, I don't have but so court. much time, where I'd love to get into a further discussion with you, but I would uh, ask uh, you, Mr. Santa, earlier uh, in the previous uh, panel, uh, there was a lot of discussion about well, we can make this happen if we only start the 12 months when there's a completed application, and I raised the concern that. Yeah, but when is an application completed? Because can't that be a moving uh, target? Do you have those same concerns, Mr. Santa? I think there is some risk of that, Mr. Griffith, but I also think that it's something if, you know, the committee is looking at ways to uh, respond to Commissioner Moeller's concerns certainly is worth further discussion. But it shouldn't just be a blanket statement. There maybe ought to be some guidelines as to when there is a finished application. Oh, very much perfect. so. I think in, in the interests of, of all concern, there needs to be clarity as to what constitutes a complete application so that it can't be used as a way to uh, game the system. 
And it always works better when Congress dictates what that is as opposed to leading it to the administrative branch of government. Isn't that true, yes or no? I'll tell you it's yes. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Mr. Parrish, do you want to make some right. comments on that point? Yeah, I, I, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I see, I see that the completed application process many times because uh, we submit permits ourselves, and we, and we work for uh, pipeline uh, transportation companies that sub submit permits for com uh, the they never seem, a lot of times, you'll send the permit in for a review and ask if it's complete. They'll send you a letter, no, it's not complete, we're going to hold it, here's the three things that aren't complete. You send those three things, and two months later, here comes another letter saying, well, we also looked at it again, and this isn't complete. So you can get into basically a rat race on de deeming what is a completed application. So whatever is done here with this bill, that needs to be clearly defined it, it, because it be, the regulatory agencies can turn that into a nightmare. And I've been through that. I've seen that happen before. And, and Mr. Paris, I have to say that, that I've only been in office in Congress for 30 months, and I've had uh, any number of complaints from my constituents about that very same problem. Uh, Mr. Markarian, do you want to weigh in on that subject as well? It's important to build safely, environmentally sensitively, and Absolutely. get the job done all at the same time. But what we take comfort in, in terms of this bill, is it doesn't shortcut any uh, reviews that are guaranteed uh, to ensure any of those things. Now, th this process will produce yeses and nos, but it doesn't uh, affect the substantive standards of environmental protection that are designed to protect Americans. It just means we've got to get it done by time certain, and that's why we're comfortable with it. And I appreciate that. I also appreciate that your company is one of those that truly exercises all of the all of the above when looking at uh, production of energy in this country. And do appreciate that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. The gentleman yields back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I assume the whole panel was here during the FERC testimony. Uh, just answer yes or no. The testimony was is that there's a 90 percent approval rating within the time frame that's the FERC rules right now. Is that correct? That's what I heard. Okay. Is that your experience, though, in, in filing for applications? I wouldn't have any evidence to counter what we heard here today. My only point is we have to plan for the next 20, 25, and 30 years when I think it's been conceded pipeline development is going to be ramped up significantly because the ability to harness gas is going to go in that same direction. Well, and I agree. But if it's 90 percent now, uh, and, you know, there may be some unintended consequences of this, uh, of the legislation I'm concerned of, including uh, saying, well, we don't have the time, it's, we just have to deny the permit. And believe me, I understand where I come from, the need for expansion of natural gas. Some of you may have heard, I've gone through Eagle Ford at night, and there's so much flaring there. Uh, one, and environmentally bad, but also I know everyone who's drilling those wells would like to have a market for that gas. And uh, so we need to expand it. <clears throat> I'm not so sure the way that's drafted this legislation will do it. Uh, but the other experiences, uh, Mr. Santa, is, do you agree or that uh, uh, INGA, that 90 percent is what, uh, what FERC's doing now? I have no reason to dispute it. We think that the FERC Office for Energy Projects does a good job. However, the one point I would make in addition is that FERC's admirable record doesn't address the delays and the need to get all of the other permits from federal and state agencies that are required before a pipeline can commence construction. And so the, the FERC record only answers part of the, the issues raised by Mr. Pompeo's bill. And I agree to that, uh, but, you know, with this legislation, I don't know if FERC's going to be able to tell the Corps of Engineers or, or even EPA or, or even a state agency that, uh, like I said, it, if a state has a unified uh, application process instead of having different states, in fact, I'd, uh, I'll probably get that from FERC on how many states have that. I would assume Texas and Louisiana have some type of one-stop shopping for pipeline permits uh, just because we do them a lot, and uh, maybe the states are not. And I know somebody said something about uh, we're going to have to have a pipelines in upper New York. <clears throat> You know, most of my drillers say, first, we need to get a permit to worry about a pipeline. And so we haven't had a permit in, in upstate New York on some of the success in the Marcella Shell. Mr. Santa, 
I appreciate you being here and worked with Inga for years, and I recognize the need for additional capacity, particularly in my state and around the country. Um, namely, the, uh, my concern, though, is the unintended consequences <clears throat> that, namely, the potential for agencies to deny a permit simply on the grounds it lacks sufficient times for an adequate and legally <clears throat> defensible review or any other scenario if it deemed approved. Um, I'd like to remind my colleagues in the majority, we did this once before and then last year when we uh, required the president to uh, approve a pipeline within 60 days or deemed it approved and he denied it. Um, I would worry that some of our pipelines that are so far down the road because there may be a problem with getting a report back from some agency would just say we'll deny it and then we'll end up starting over again. Uh, so that's my worry. Ms. Santa, are you worried about the potential denials? I, I know earlier in a question you said, if it's a no, it's a no. But um, what happens when they deny it? Uh, filing a lawsuit virtually guarantees additional delay. Well, I think that, you know, as Mr. McCarrion said, a, a, sometimes a definite no is better than an indefinite uh, maybe in terms of businesses and their planning. I also think that, that you know, as I've noted, this bill establishes a two-way street. I mean, it will hold the agencies, the permitting agencies, more accountable. But quite frankly, the pipeline industry is going to be more accountable for filing complete, timely applications so as to not put the agency in that bind and, and produce that undesirable result. So, and, and I know hopefully there will be an amendment that would talk about a completed application before the time starts running. So you have that. And I don't think the, the bill actually says that now. But... Um, and, and I understand you'd rather have a yes or no than a maybe, but if a maybe would delay, would, would get you further down the road. But that ought to be the completed application process. That ought to be decided up front when you get that completed application. Um, Commissioner Mueller also warned that a 90-day deadline may force agencies to add burdensome conditions as a way to protect themselves from ac accusations of insufficient review or is Inga or any of you on the panel concerned about that? I know, obviously, I'm interested in building pipelines to handle both the, the natural gas, but also, uh, you know, to get it to a market, whether it be an export market that I support or, or either, you know, power generation. I mean, agencies frequently condition permits today. So I think the notion of receiving conditions in connection with an environmental permit is, is not something new and, and if it leads the agencies to do that to ensure that, that all, you know, bases are covered, I think that's one of the consequences. Okay. And I, I think I, if an agency acts capriciously or, or in a way that it shouldn't, that brings heat of its own on the agency. So I think we can count on the agencies to act in good faith to, if it's a, a denial, a denial in good faith. Yeah. Well, in... Some of you know I've been around long enough that I know that I had problems with FERC, and I know uh, Mr. Kessler does, and you may have been on the staff when we had some battles with FERC over the years. But in the last few years, having dealt with them, and like I said, a lot of your members I work with literally every day almost in the Houston area haven't had a problem with FERC, because if it is, believe me, I would be there uh, saying, what are we doing with it? Um, Ms. Ann, I've read where permitting time frames are even longer now than they were before we streamlined the process in the 2005 energy bill. Why is that, uh, why is it longer, the time frames longer than when we did in the, uh, uh, as Joe Barton and, and I brag about all the time? Uh, Mr. Green, I'm not sure there is any causal connection between the EPAC 2005 provisions and what has happened. Uh, the, the Inga Foundation report that we, we reference in our testimony uh, had a survey and then more in-depth interviews with a, a subset of, of those pipeline companies. There were a variety of reasons identified, uh, including inexperience on the part of the, the agencies in dealing with linear projects like this, other priorities at the agencies, uh, interagency disputes. And also, in, in some instances, quite frankly, deficiencies on the part of the pipeline applicants. Um, but as the report noted, the, probably the main recommendation coming out of there was providing some teeth, some enforceability to the EPAC 2005 provisions to prompt the incentive to address all of that. Gentlemen, time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. <laughs>
That concludes uh, today's hearing on H.R. 1900. I want to thank uh, those of you who joined us to get today. We, as I said, appreciate your insights, your suggestions, your thoughts, and uh, uh, we've all looked at your opening st statements, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward to address uh, these many complicated energy issues. So thank you, and that concludes today's hearing. The record will remain open for 10, 10 days. Thank you.